Vinay, I think we can start. Sure. Good evening and a very warm welcome to everyone who have gathered with us virtually for a two-day e-course on the fundamentals of respiratory care in COVID-19 for healthcare professionals. This e-course is jointly organized by the Department of Respiratory Therapy, uh, Manipal College of Health Professions, MAHE, and the Indian Association of Respiratory Care. I begin with a brief overview of today's session. The inauguration of the e-course is scheduled for 5.50 p.m. to the convenience of our distinguished guest of honor, Ms. Kavita Narayan, and the, who's the advisor, HRH, for Health Systems at Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India. So we have in store for you very interesting sessions on oxygen therapy, high flow nasal oxygen in COVID-19, non-invasive ventilation, and aerosolized medications in COVID-19 taken by our distinguished faculty. Uh, so we will have a panel discussion following uh, this classes on the theme, the multidisciplinary approach in COVID-19 led by our renowned respiratory therapist, Mr. Daniel Rowley and Mr. Sri Harsha Tatineni. So I wish you all a very enjoyable learning session today. And uh, before we start the sessions, I request all the audience for clarifying any queries. You can please uh, type down in your chat box and the questions will be cleared in the chat box or after the sessions to your delight. So uh, we begin with a session on oxygen therapy, a practical guide for healthcare professionals. So this session will be taken by Mr. Jitin K. Sridharan. Uh, BSCRRT, MSCRRT, and uh, who is the governor of for India, Indian Council of Respiratory Care, and also the general secretary of Indian Association of Respiratory Care. So Jitin is one of the top rank holding graduates in respiratory therapy from the prestigious Sri Jayadeva Institute of Cardiovascular Research Center, Bangalore Medical College, and uh, Rajiv Gandhi University of Health Sciences. He possesses a master's degree in respiratory care with neonatal and pediatric care, and he has worked as the Chief of Respiratory Care Services at Amrita Institute of Medical Science and Research Center, Cochin. During the tenure, uh, he, has also, he was also appointed as Senior Coordinator for the Allied Healthcare Programs. And during his tenure, his team regulated 13 Allied Healthcare Programs and consolidated their curriculum. He also served as the renowned uh, Singapore General uh, Hospital Singapore as a Senior Respiratory Therapist and a specialist in respiratory care at the Prince Sultan Cardiac, Cent Cardiac Care Center, Al Hasa, Al -Hasa uh, Saudi Arabia. And presently, he's the governor for India at the International Council for Respiratory Care, uh, general secretary for the Indian Association of Respiratory Care also. So he's also the board of studies member for the Allied Health Sciences Program at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. He has more than 20 publications in the field of respiratory therapy. Uh, with this kind introduction, I ask Mr. Jitin to take over the stage. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you uh, for that generous introduction. Uh, good evening, all of you. It is an honor and uh, privilege for being with you today. Uh, to the faculty and staff of the RT program at Manipal, respected uh, Dean, Dr. Arun Maya, sir. Thank you for organizing this meaningful scientific program and choosing Indian Association of Respiratory Care uh, as a scientific partner. Thanks to Dr. Manjush, Ms. Tisha, Ms. Uh, Madhra Gauri, along with the members of the Indian Academy of Respiratory Care for your tremendous efforts to conduct such an outstanding scientific series, which is benefiting thousands of healthcare providers in the country and instilling confidence to practice efficiently. We are so proud of you all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Vibrant students and staff of uh, Manipal College of Allied Health Professions and uh, Allied Health Institutions across the country. Healthcare providers with diverse background who is uh, digitally connected to this pro program from across the globe and uh, on behalf of the Executive Board of IARC, Indian Academy of Respiratory Care, eminent faculty members of the RT program at Manipal, and the organizing team from Manipal College of Allied Health uh, Care Professions uh, uh, College, 
a warm welcome to one and all. Dear Friendline Healthcare mm -hmm. Providers, thank you for uh, joining us today, for spending some time for acquiring knowledge, hearing the pioneers and sharing your experience for better serving the patients in, uh, in a more competent manner. I bow my head down to your determination, compassion, and resilience. We are all proud of what we are doing for the humanity. We are putting ourselves and our families at risk, consciously risking our life for the well-being of others. On behalf of uh, Indian Association of Respiratory Care and the International Council for Respiratory Care, thank you once again for all what you do. The key aim of this educational series is to enhance the skillful knowledge of all healthcare professionals to effectively manage acutely ill patients who has COVID-19. Today, I will begin this session with oxygen therapy, a practical guide for healthcare providers. During this session, we will be discussing the very basic practical aspects of uh, the mechanism of hypoxemia in, uh, or hypoxia in COVID-19 goals of oxygen therapy and about various oxygen storage and delivery systems that, uh, that are available at its, uh, uh, its scale. I have no affiliational, financial or institutional benefits or conflicts of interest to disclose. Some of the views expressed in this presentation are subjective to the evidence-based practices and anecdotal experiences that are currently available in the literature. All of us know oxygen is necessary for all metabolic process of oxygen deficiency impacts oxygen uh, organ function. If it left untreated, it can cause irreversible damage in the due course. The first line treatment of hypoxemia is supplemental oxygen. And hence, oxygen therapy is defined as the administration, administration of oxygen at concentrations greater than that in ambient air. You all know that what is the ambient air oxygen concentration is 21%. With the intent of treating or preventing the symptoms and manifestations of hypoxemia. Bear in mind that oxygen is a treatment for hypoxemia, not for breathlessness. You must remember that supplemental oxygen is given to improve oxygenation. But it does not treat the underlying grounds of hypoxemia, which must be diagnosed and treated as a matter of urgency. Coronavirus brings widespread inflammatory reaction, subsequently leads to damage of the type 1 and type 2 alveolar cells. This triggers an acute respiratory distress syndrome-like response, resulting in hypoxemia, which, uh, which could vary in severity. The data from available studies shows that 14% of them will present with type 1 respiratory failure. Out of that, 5% will be requiring ICU admissions. All these levels of mild to severe hypoxemia will require non-invasive respiratory support. Some patients often do not have breathing problems. Careful. There won't be any signs of hypercapnia or any signs of hypoxemia or dyspnea even. Still, they have low saturation. This coins the term happy hypoxemia. Hypoxemia in the early phase of COVID-19 causes damage to the pulmonary vessels and impaired transfer of oxygen. However, if the patient deteriorates, his lungs will worsen to ARDS. This is a simple pathophysiology of COVID-19 lungs. Development of interstitial pneumonia causing mild to moderate and severe hypoxemic respiratory failure, as you can see in the picture. Then further to that ARDS, shock and multi-organ dysfunction syndromes. As you are aware, COVID-19 infected patients are categorized into mild, moderate and severe categories. In patients with moderate, severe disease levels, oxygen therapy is a necessary initial treatment. Remember, oxygen needs to be performed Rational with close monitoring without delaying intubation. That means giving oxygen is not the final treatment for coronavirus or COVID-19 or breathlessness. You may have to escalate the treatment strategy in time for a successful outcome. There are three simple ways to determine whether the patient needs oxygen therapy. 
The first is the use of laboratory measures such as arterial blood gas testing or document and to document hypoxemia. Now, most of us are very familiar with pulse oximetry. It, all, it, it says oxygen levels, if they are less than 94%, which is requirement, which is a requirement for oxygen after uh, completing the medical evaluation. Let me say the oxygen saturation should be checked by pulse oximetry in all breathless patients, uh, whether they are acutely ill or whether they are admitted to the emergency room or in the ambulance itself. This should be considered as the fifth vital sign. It is, and it is very important to document the inspired oxygen concentration at the time of measurement on the observation uh, chart or a respiratory chart. It is important to know the low or high saturation that you observe through the pulse oximetry was noted while the patient was on oxygen supplementation or on room air. Secondly, Patients' need for oxygen therapy can be based on specific clinical problems or conditions, in, in, in the, and the, this is the traditional way. Finally, the, the physical signs. Hypoxemia may cause tachypnea, tachycardia, cyanosis, and distressed overall appearance. Perhaps it is important to understand, especially in COVID-19, we are dealing with an illness that will rapidly evolve and patient can rapidly deteriorate. Therefore, we should not give oxygen at limited facilities and feel complacent that we are given the appropriate treatment. So if a person's oxygen level is dropping while you're at home or at your primary care center, the complete care that he requires can be given only at a hospital facility. You must understand this. Refer the patient early to a center where you have high level of care facilities that are available. The main objective of oxygen therapy is to keep an acceptable tissue oxygenation. By supplementing the oxygen, we will be increasing the alveolar and blood oxygen uh, uh, level to correct hypoxemia. In addition to that, uh, it decreases the symptoms which are associated with hypoxemia, such as dyspnea and altered sensorium. Oxygen therapy also decreases the cardiac workload and reduces the pulmonary vasoconstriction. The saturation target, that's what you are always looking for at the ward or in the ICU or even at the home. This target can be aimed at someone if they have or if they are admitted in the ward from in the ward, it can start from 90 to 92 to 94%. The, the typical idea is to decrease the wastage of oxygen and associated complications of hyperoxia. In the ICU where your patient is in a highly monitored setting, target even a lower saturation that start from 90 to 92 percent because if there is an emergency you have an expert team around and your patient is totally under your observation let's come to the oxygen sources first one is home oxygen concentrator which is an electrically powered uh, device intended to distillate oxygen from atmospheric air Government of India recently declared they will be uh, uh, securing more than one lakh of oxygen concentrators and distribute them in high burden uh, states as an alternative to the depleting resources of liquid medical oxygen. The scarcity of oxygen cylinders are, uh, are pushed the concentrated market at the forefront of the home isolated patients and moderate patients in the hospitals. But using the correct specification is also important. You must know that what is the production capacity of oxygen concentrator that you are purchasing? Just looking at the price is not sufficient. There are mainly uh, two types, low flow and high flow oxygen devices. Further to that, continuous flow and pulse dose concentrators. Continuous flow oxygen will uh, provide the same flow of oxygen every minute unless it is turned off, irrespective of whether the patient is breathing it uh, or not. While the pulse dose oxygen concentrator detects the breathing pattern and uh, dispenses oxygen when it detects inhalation. The oxygen di dispensed per uh, minute will vary uh, in the, uh, the pulse flow uh, oxygen concentrator. That is the difference. There is also machines available for home use purpose as well as for, uh, like, like for portable uh, kind of machines. The portable one can be carried uh, if you go out for a morning walk. But remember, uh, the flow of oxygen concentration produced will be less compared to the home uh, oxygen device or oxygen concentrator. 
uh, oxide concentrator, uh, the working principle is very simple. It physically separates the oxygen from uh, room air, uh, that is nitrogen and carbon dioxide and water contents. Oxygen concentrator typically delivers to 1, 0.5 to uh, 10 liter of flow, which varies in concentration from uh, you know uh, 80 to 100 percentage. You must take in you must take care of the oxygen concentrate when you use them at home. The machine should be kept at least uh, two meter, two feet away from uh, any objects or a wall. A filter should be, uh, uh, there is a filter behind uh, every oxygen concentrate. It must be checked periodically for blockage and debris uh, uh, based on the manufacturer's recommendations. The most important thing that you must remember as a healthcare practitioner is concentrate is not a device that is supposed to be used for emergency use. It, uh, it will take minimum 20 minutes to produce high concentration of oxygen once you turn on the device. You are very familiar with this particular source or sources. However, uh, the first picture that I show is a liquid oxygen cylinder, <coughs> which is not very commonly seen uh, in our country. Why I show here? Because, uh, because now our neighboring countries are sending uh, uh, a lot of oxygen delivery devices and such kind of advanced uh, cylinders and storage devices. Uh, you may see them in, in your market or in your hospital when, uh, when it comes there. Uh, so you should be familiar with that. This is the liquid oxygen uh, delivery system, small cylinders, portable liquid oxygen systems, which can, uh, which can deliver the same oxygen concentration, but the capacity and the duration is longer than that of the other, machine, other cylinders. Uh, the second one, as you can see, the hospital wall outlets, we are very familiar with them. Uh, they are 50 PSIG pressure is maintained in, in at the outlet. No need to monitor the storage capacity and all because it will be taken care by the biomedical engineers. But take care of the outlet and control the flow based on the requirement that you are describing for the patient. The next one is a compressed gas cylinder which contains the oxygen in a gaseous form. It requires pressure reducing valve and a flow meter to deliver the desired oxygen flow. Why I mentioned that you need additional accessories for delivering oxygen. I know that uh, when I was delivering a lecture for the public uh, in, in, in one of the uh, program, they mentioned one of the, the uh, person who procured a machine and stored at home, but uh, he do not have a, a range and a flow meter and, a, uh, and a, uh, a regulator for operating this particular cylinder. There are multiple size cylinders available in the market. In India, the, uh, there are uh, three sizes of oxygen cylinders are commonly used, uh, which is E cylinder, F cylinder, and an H cylinder, uh, which varies in capacity starting from 600 liter to 6,900 liter. But what we must know, the duration of flow of a cylinder, uh, which need to be estimated, we, uh, particularly when you are transporting a patient, because you may, may not get an additional cylinder if you don't store them, if you don't calculate the duration of the cylinder, how long it is going to last for you. Based on cylinder size, the cylinder factor can be chosen uh, for easy uh, for you to understand. Uh, remember these two uh, particular uh, cylinder factors. One is for E cylinder, very common for us. Another one is H cylinder, which is also very common for uh, hospital settings. Uh, for H cylinder, it is 3.14 and uh, the cylinder factor for E cylinder is 0.28. There are different kind of formulas available why i am showing you this is the the easiest one for you to remember so when when you once you put that in this particular formula you can easily calculate the, the cylinder duration uh, uh, how long the cylinder lasts for you uh, when you prescribe specific flow of oxygen for a particular patient uh, you see i'm i'm giving here with an example uh, there, there is a reason why I specifically mentioned this scenario because it is reported from many hospitals that the persons uh, prescribing the oxygen will not be looking after the patient for continuously. So they will be prescribing and uh, they will set the oxygen in the ward, a junior fellow or somebody who doesn't have much idea about this particular operation. When they see the patient is gasping or patient is saying that I need more oxygen, uh, he will just double the oxygen flow from its current flow. Remember that uh, when you double the flow, actually the duration and the life of the oxygen cylinder is going to become uh, half life and it may create uh, fatal results. When you care the cylinder, you must be uh, very careful uh, when you operate the cylinder. You should not uh, deal the cylinder as same as that of a cylinder that you deal at home for liquid, uh, you know, I mean, I mean for uh, uh, cooking 
uh, gas cylinders. Uh, store the cylinders away from any combustible material, away from boilers, open flames, steam pipes, or any potential sources of heat. If a cylinder is not in use, keep the, uh, keep the protective cylinder cap in place. Whenever you are moving the cylinder from one place to another, always use, um, use a, a cylinder cart for moving and uh, chain the cylinder with a wall uh, for protecting it from falling down. <coughs> When gas source is high pressure gas cylinder, as you can see uh, a regulate in this picture, you need a regulator for reducing the uh, valve and a flow meter for adjusting the flow of oxygen. There are two mainly uh, two types of flow meters are available uh, 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 for transportation. Remember not to use uh, such kind of flow meter that you are seeing in the video, because when you transport, you may have to keep the cylinder on the floor lying down. This kind of flow meters are gravity dependent, so always use a flow meter which is not affected or a regulator which is not affected due to gravity. Mainly they are called as the burden gauge. You can use such kind of advanced uh, 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 flow meters and regulator for transporting the patient especially. Or else if you are using the flow meter um, uh, at home, at, at the hospital, always try to keep the flow meter with uh, uh, upright position. The general performance characteristics of any oxygen system has paramount importance in the successful oxygen therapy uh, program. In a low flow system such as nasal cannula, simple face mask, uh, non rebreathing mask, the patient needs to throw the remainder air from his uh, minute volume. Whereas a high flow delivery system provides the full amount of oxygen uh, that the patient inhales. Therefore, the FAO2 remains stable. This simple diagram explains uh, what I was telling you earlier. The blue dotted lines. Uh, uh, in the in the flow of the device in a in a low flow device as you can see uh, as long as the minute volume remains less the patient devices uh, uh, total gas flow and the fo2 remains stable however if it increases it will no longer deliver the high fo2 on the other side the high flow device is already providing adequate gas flow at a higher level as you can see that is marked as b line in the figure uh, to cater for all kinds of uh, needs of the patient uh, a holistic assessment of the uh, assessment of the severity of the patient's respiratory condition is essential to start and escalate the oxygen therapy. For patients with moderate to severe dyspnea, a respiratory frequency of 20 to 30 breaths per minute uh, with a saturation of less than 94 percentage and a FAO to PO2 ratio of less than 300, oxygen can be initially given through a nasal cannula, then titrated to a simple face mask and to a venturi face mask and uh, so on uh, to NIV, uh, high flow nasal cannula, NIV and the invasive ventilation. Uh, via nasal cannula, mostly you must know what is the flow rate uh, that you can give. You can see in the table, uh, uh, perhaps you can support uh, uh, in the table, every one liter of uh, uh, increase in oxygen flow is increasing four percentage of uh, FiO2. Uh, nevertheless, do not exceed six liter of flow because such high flow rate will irritate the nasal mucosa and that can uh, even lead to bleeding. Whereas a simple face mask uh, has uh, exhalation, uh, you know, pores you know, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the sides that allow, sorry, uh, uh, you can see in the picture that allow uh, 6 to 10 liter per minute of flow and it can deliver up to 60 percentage of AO2. Uh, in this particular device, what you need to remember is do not reduce the flow below 5 liter. It will create, uh, you know, carbon dioxide rebreathing and that will, uh, uh, that will have a uh, uh, detrimental effect. Uh, you can further escalate to a non-rebreathing mask which contain a reservoir bag which will, which will be always filled with oxygen. When the patient uh, needs, he will draw the oxygen, high concentration oxygen from the bag that you, that you attach to this particular mask. Uh, the delivery of FAO2 can be up to 0.8 or 80 percentage. Uh, the, 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 another approach that uh, recently seen in this particular COVID-19 time is placing a, a non-rebreathing mask over a nasal cannula, which delivers an FAO2, FAO2 higher level. This will also help to prevent uh, inadvertent uh, accumulation of carbon dioxide in hyponasal panics. Ensure that the reservoir bag is always filled with oxygen. Uh, 12 to 15 liter of oxygen flow is always required. As you see in this particular video, the bag should be at least one third inflated even during an inhalation phase. However, all these modalities can also be started as the initial or the first line oxygen therapy depending on the patient condition. 
Uh, when considering a stepwise approach for providing supplemental oxygen, start with either a nasal cannula, then to a, a simple face mask, and then go to a non rebreathing or a non rebreathing with a nasal cannula in place. Uh, the evaluation uh, and monitoring. Um, I mean, the therapeutic response should be always done at least 30 minutes uh, for the first one hour. And uh, conventional oxygen does not provide clinical improvement. Uh, in that case, uh, high flow nasal cannula can be given. It is important to closely monitor in the first two hours of your uh, oxygen therapy, taking into account that possibility of silent hypoxemia, and uh, especially in uh, younger patients. In silent hypoxemia, the patient does not uh, experience significant respiratory distress, but uh, it uh, shows a low saturation. If there is no clinical improvement, consider non-invasive uh, ventilation or uh, invasive mechanical ventilation. You can follow this particular chart, what I have shown there, and also the references given for your uh, further uh, reference. Uh, uh, the, avoid these pitfalls, avoid benzodiazepines or narcotics in the initial treatment of uh, agitated patients. Giving these drugs uh, for a patient as uh, agitation, uh, uh, as agitation due to hypoxemia could be lethal. In a uh, patient with uh, COPD, high emphysema, be careful when administering oxygen. These patients often have hypercarbia, so the over administration of oxygen for an uh, extended period of time can affect their hypoxemic respiratory drive, which will lead to further uh, hypercarbia, altered mental status, and even a complete uh, respiratory collapse. Check oxygen uh, if it is flowing continuously, the tubings are connected always, and they are not kinked, the cylinder has adequate storage, etc. The literature says all forms of oxygen supplementation may potentially aerosolize the respiratory pathogens such as COVID-19, Take necessary precautions and measures to protect ourselves and our patients. A well-fitting standard uh, surgical mask uh, uh, can significantly reduce the aerosolization when placed over oxygen therapy devices. Therefore, consider to place a surgical mask over the oxygen uh, delivery device. Uh, to conclude, uh, obviously, the sub Supplemental oxygen therapy is a life-saving supportive uh, treatment in hypoxemic COVID-19 patients. Um, rational uh, management of oxygen therapy includes the provision of initial therapy followed by uh, proper monitoring and escalation without delaying intubation. And uh, supreme consideration must be given to the healthcare workers' uh, protection and the risk of trans uh, transmission. Uh, to understand all about uh, oxygen therapy, I strongly suggest uh, you to read uh, from this particular article published in the May June issue of Indian Journal of Respiratory Care by Ms. Pradipa Todur and her colleagues from the Department of Respiratory Therapy at Manipal. Such a beautifully narrated article in every uh, in a very simple language. Uh, I congratulate her and her colleagues for this outstanding review. Probably this is the first of its kind in the COVID nineteen era. And I thank you so much for your patient listening and looking forward to your questions and uh, experiences in the upcoming session. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for uh, sharing the knowledge you have garnered over your years of caring and treating the patients and uh, training many RTs in the process. So we have uh, one question in the chat box, which is, uh, what is the difference between a non-rebreather and and a, a rebreathing mask when the FiO2 is small at, uh, at all oxygen flow? Non rebreathing mask and a rebreathing mask. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, it is it, uh, non rebreathing. We are talking particularly about a COVID 19 application of this particular mask. If you look at non rebreathing and rebreathing mask, only difference is a valve. There are three types of bags with valves or, or bags are available, uh, starting with partial rebreathing, non-rebreathing, and rebreathing mask. A rebreathing mask by itself, it's saying about the term itself, it's going to be allowing the patient to rebreathe a certain amount of carbon dioxide, especially when the patient who is, uh, you know, having a brain injury. Uh, sometimes uh, the patient will be hyperventilating because this is kind of uh, one of the treatment uh, options that we give for such kind of patient to rebreathe carbon dioxide. So uh, the only difference is 
uh, there is a absence of a valve in the uh, in the orifice of uh, uh, the back which is actually present in all the other partial and uh, non uh, partial rebreathing and non rebreathing mask which is not there in the rebreathing mask thank you uh, so i request the audience if there are any questions to kindly type it down in the chat box the uh, panelists or the faculty will try to answer it in the chat box okay uh, thank you so next up we have an interesting session on the high flow nasal oxygen in covid 19 the session will be taken by mr sanjay shashikumar mr sanjay has completed his graduation and post graduation in respiratory therapy from manipal academy of higher education and a career spanning over 8 years he has worked in india as an academician and as a full time respiratory therapist in prestigious prestigious medical colleges in kerala so on moving out of india he started his journey as a lecturer in saudi arabia and later moved to the united arab emirates to pursue a career as a full time respiratory therapist in a tertiary care hospital he is an aha certified instructor for bls and acls and he is one of the super users of the electronic medical records documentation in the current hospital so he is associated with multiple journals in respiratory care as a reviewer his areas of interest are mechanical ventilation in adult and non invasive ventilation strategies over to you sir thank you so much vinay thank you for that wonderful introduction um, so uh, i will share my screen Uh, I'm not able to share my screen. It is showing it is disabled. Okay, good evening everyone. Uh, today, uh, my topic will be on uh, high flow nasal oxygen in the COVID-19 era. So uh, to start with, so I have a disclosure to make. I have no affiliation of financial or institutional benefits or conflicts of interest to disclose. Some of the views expressed in the presentation are subjective to the evidence-based practices and anecdotal experiences that are currently available in the literature. All the pictures and illustrations are collected from the respective owners or company and are not owned and publicized by me. So to begin with, as you know, um, hypoxic respiratory failure is one of the predominant uh, cause for COVID-19 and it has been found it's almost 19 percentage. Although the true incidence of hypoxic respiratory failure in COVID-19 is not clear, it has been suggested that 14 percent of them will develop a severe disease that they require oxygen therapy and of which about 5% of them would require an ICU admission or and mechanical ventilation. So compared to the standard oxygen therapy, uh, it has been found that high flow nasal oxygen actually reduces the need for endotracheal intubation in ARDS patients. So basically what is high flow nasal oxygen? It is also commonly termed as high flow nasal cannula. It has become popular nowadays in acute respiratory failure. It can be used in any age groups. It is basically a device uh, which takes gas. That is, it is air and oxygen. It's a combination and it heats it at 37 degrees Celsius with 100% relative humidity. It can deliver an FIO2 ranging from 21 to 100% at flow rates ranging from 1 to 60 liters per minute or more. So, and uh, generally, a high flow nasal cannula device actually has all these features. 
so uh, it has been believed basically the mechanism which is believed to cause the improvement of high flow nasal cannula efficiency is high flow the mnemonic is actually high flow so where h stands for the heat and humidification which is provided i for the inspiratory flow which can be altered depending on the patient's inspiratory demand functional residual capacity it is light because it is humidified it's oxygen oxygen delivery where you can set the range and there is a wash out of dead space so to brief up on the mechanism where heat and humidification it improves because of humidification it improves the mucociliary clearance it avoids any injury due to the high flow and it enhances the patient comfort whereas inspiratory flow uh, you can alter it so it improves the breathing pattern it thereby reduces the inspiratory demand and also helps in improving the tidal volume functional residual capacity yes it improves that it causes a decrease in work of breathing it has been suggested that 1 cm of peep is generated for every 10 meters per minute of flow when the the flow is delivered with a closed mouth breathing so it is believed that it can reach about 6 cm of water of peep light because a uh, one the nasal prongs which is being used is soft it is small and it is more comfortable for the patient and the patient can actually eat and drink at any time oxygen delivery yes it you can it is an fiat it ranges between 21 to 100 percent and it always delivers a oxygen what is set wash out of dead space because there is an improvement in ventilation and oxygen delivery so basically as you increase the flow and there is fresh oxygen which actually washes out all the carbon dioxide which is there in the upper airways and also the lower airways any time when the patient tries to breathe he or he or she always gets a fresh flow of oxygen so thereby it helps to remove the dead space and it improves the oxygen delivery so there are three different types of flow generators basically for high flow three different type of machines are available there is the air oxygen blender the turbines and venturi so air oxygen blender is basically it is a flow meter uh, it uses a mechanical air oxygen blender and a flow meter which is connected and the oxygen concentrations and the flow are usually very stable so it is the devices which usually have them are the bird blender and also a biomed device of air oxygen blender next this is a commonly one which is used it's called the turbine system so here the flow generator is basically built into the system so the oxygen is supplied by a low pressure system and the device which is being used it can monitor the oxygen concentration and also it can measure the flow which is delivered to the patient so the commonly used device are the airvo2 from fisher and packer and the persistion flow by vaporter the last is which works on the venturi principle so this device basically generates a high flow by a venturi principle so it actually is composed of a flow meter and an oxygen concentrator which concentration monitor so it analyzes the oxygen level which is delivered now the biggest issue with this device is that as the flow increases the noise generation is very high so the commonly present device are the max venturi and the oximer high flow by draeger but nowadays they have been a modification where there is a silencer which actually helps to reduce the noise so these are the three types of flow generating devices so in what conditions can you use high flow nasal oxygen i'm sure all of you are aware of it so it's commonly used in acute hypoxemic respiratory failure in post surgical respiratory failure in acute heart failure like in pulmonary edema hypercapnic respiratory failure pre and post extubation oxygenation so basically we also have been using it for post extubation and we have found that it actually helps the patient to wean them off faster from regular oxygen therapy and to transfer them out from the iso obstructive sleep apnea the use in the emergency department after high flow nasal oxygen has been come into the market in our emergency department it's very commonly used it has given excellent results we even did not require the patient to go ahead even for non invasive ventilation so it has been given a good use and in do not intubate status like in terminal illness contra indications so basically if there is an active epistasis any recent nasal injury a known nasal obstruction like nasal polyps or deviated nasal septum basal or skull fracture low level of consciousness any recurrent apnea a patient who has a severe respiratory acidosis a ph of less than 7.2 
and in case of severe sepsis with multi organ failure in these conditions you are you should shouldn't use hypronasal oxygen so before i move into the further details i would like to give a small insight on rox index so rox index which is now used for to determine the success of high flow nasal cannula was established by Rocca and colleagues in 2016. So it is basically an index to predict the success of high flow nasal cannula. So the Rox index actually combines of three measurements. These are non-invasive measurements. They are the FiO2, the saturation, and the respiratory rate. So basically this index, it, uh, once it is calculated, and the Rox index is calculated by saturation divided by the FiO2, the whole divided by the respiratory rate. So it gives you the uh, idea that more the sicker the patient, the more oxygen is required and at a very high respiratory rate. So basically, this index gives you an idea whether your high flow nasal cannula is appropriate. So in order to validate this ROX index, it was actually done in a multi-center prospective study for over 190 patients with pneumonia. So ROX index usually which was calculated during the study was between the that is at first at two hours at six hours and at 12 hours at the initiation of high flow nasal oxygen so it was found that a rate that is a value of above 4.8 is considered to be a good success for uh, roxin a uh, good success for high flow nasal oxygen so as you can see initially after the initiation of high flow nasal oxygen uh, the first two hours it was measured it was 2.8 further as the time passed by the ROX index value started to improve. So it actually was giving you an upward trend. So this suggests that the uh, high flow nasal oxygen is appropriate for the patient and it is uh, well tolerated. So the success rate is quite high. So as we finish about ROX index, next I will move into the recommendations by certain um, organizations which have put forward regarding the use of high flow nasal oxygen. So the World Health Organization has said that this high flow nasal cannula can actually be used in mild form of ARDS. The National Institute of Health has recommended over NIV in patients with uh, acute hypoxic respiratory failure despite the failure of standard oxygen therapy devices. The surviving sepsis campaign suggested use of high flow over uh, supplemental oxygen therapy and NIV in patients with hypoxic respiratory failure. Well, and last, the Australian New Zealand Intensive Care Society has said to consider high flow nasal cannula for patients with hypoxemia. So this is a summary about the recommendations given by the surviving sepsis campaign for uh, COVID-19 patients for you how to use and when to escalate. So if you have a COVID-19 patient with hypoxemia and if there is We'll go in with the center part of the flow sheet. Uh, there is no indication for uh, endotracheal intubation. So you will start with supplementary oxygen. In case supplementary oxygen is not sufficiently enough, they have said to consider high flow nasal oxygen. If high flow nasal oxygen fails, and if the patient is able to be tolerated on non-invasive ventilation, it is better to use non-invasive. But if not, you have to proceed to endotracheal intubation. So this flow sheet, is actually been uh, derived from the surviving sepsis campaign. You can actually follow it with the reference below. So now we will move on to how to start with high flow nasal cannula. So initial setting. So depending on the device availability at your uh, hospital and uh, whatever unnecessary consumables are needed for initiation of high flow nasal cannula, you have to set up the device. There is at present there is no clear evidence regarding the exact settings which can be used for uh, initiation of high flow nasal cannula. So at first you, whichever is your device, you have to set the temperature. You can start at thirty seven degrees Celsius uh, uh, because it is equal to the body temperature. Next you set the initial flow rate. So if you have a very distressed individual, like which happens very commonly in COVID nineteen patients who actually come into the emergency department, you start at 40 liters per minute. And if you are having in a pediatric category, you can start between one to two uh, liters per minute per kg up to eight kilograms. You can start with that flow rate. Once the flow rate is set, then you start, you set the FIO2. So you target an FIO2 for adult patients for about 94% and above with the first 24 hours in the initiation of high flow nasal cannula. 
and then later it can be tried. So basically it is said that a person who requires high flow nasal oxygen at the initial year is severely hypoxic. So the body has to get used to the, um, you know, the new uh, device and there is a time uh, which actually it requires for it. So since the patient is severely hypoxic, you have to give 24 hours, you have to target a saturation of 94% and above. And after that is uh, completed, you can gradually reduce the FiO2 to target a saturation between 92 to 96. So regarding monitoring, so you have to keep track of the vitals to monitor any deterioration. Make sure that the saturation is maintained 92% and above. A routine ABG can be done in order to assess if there is any uh, respiratory acidosis or any severe hypoxemia uh, to assess that in the early stage. Make sure that if possible, please calculate the ROX index. So you calculate the ROX index initially at two hours, then six hours and 12 hours. See the trend, if the trend is on the upward or the downward trend. And if you are able to achieve a ROX index of above 4.8, then it is considered that the outcome is better. The patient will just require only high flow nasal cannula. But it's not necessary that you need to achieve the value at all time. The trend is more important. So make sure that the trend is on the upward trend. So in case if the values are falling down, then you have to consider either NIV or endotracheal intubation depending on the patient's condition. So now weaning from high flow nasal oxygen. So we start with the FiO2. So you, once you are targeting your saturation above 92%, you can start gradually reducing the FiO2 if the patient is clinically stable, the respiratory rates are less than 30, there is no tachycardia. So in those conditions where you know that the patient is clinically stable, you can start gradually reducing the FiO2. So you try to target an FiO2 up to 50%. Once that is achieved, then you can consider reducing the flow rate. So for pediatric categories, you can reduce the flow rate of 1 to 2 liters per minute every 4 hours. And whereas in an adult, you can go by 5 to 10 liters per minute every 4 hours. So make sure that when you are gradually weaning the patient from high flow nasal cannula, you should also keep track of any respiratory distress. And if required, you can also do ABG in order to assess for any hypoxemia. Once you are able to come down the flow um, up to say 30 liters per minute, you can gradually shift them to a low flow oxygen uh, therapy device like a non-rebreather mask and make sure that after that you assess for any deterioration and you can uh, check for ABG values if there is no further deterioration in your ABG result. So there are some considerations. So now, as you know that this high flow nasal oxygen is a aerosol generating procedure and it requires proper airborne precautions. So if you, there is a good airborne precautions, uh, you can actually consider that it's an aerosol dispersion procedure because it disperses the aerosol. So basically, in short to say, high flow nasal oxygen should be started in a room where there is negative pressure and the healthcare profession should wear level 3 PPE. This is in order for you to protect yourself from getting COVID-19. Now, we have been, uh, we have been as, uh, requesting patients or suggesting them to go on prone, to be on prone position or lateral position according to the convenience of the patient because it has been shown that awake prone along with high flow nasal cannula has reduced the incidence of endotracheal intubation or non-invasive ventilation requirements. So we have been doing this. We have a protocol here and it has been followed strictly. So we are able to reduce the rate of endotracheal intubation with prone position because saturation immediately improves for most of the patients when they are on the prone position with high flow nasal oxygen. Now, consider the use of saline nasal spray or decongestant is basically to, to relieve any blocked nose, which is often complained by patients when you know they are on high flow nasal cannula for a very really long time. Chances of epistasis is quite high because all most of the COVID-19 patients on their treatment protocol will be on anticoagulants. So if there is severe um, nasal bleed, it has to be addressed and it has to be uh, assessed appropriately. Make sure that the water levels in the humidifier is maintained at all times, otherwise it will cause severe drying up of, of the patient's nostrils. Now, as I mentioned, this hypronasal oxygen is an aerosol dispersion procedure. So in order to reduce the dispersion further, you can suggest the patient to wear a surgical mask uh, over their nose and mouth. This can reduce considerably amount of aerosol dispersion. <clears throat> 
or even you can use a simple face mask without an oxygen connection, just a normal face mask over the patient's face. This also will help the purpose. Then there is a device which was being manufactured by Vapotum, which is called the Felix One Negative Pressure Scavenger Device. So uh, in this device, if you can notice, this patient is on high flow nasal cannula and uh, the scavenger device, the negative scavenger device is placed uh, on the patient's face and it is connected to a negative low pressure, negative pressure system. So it basically it causes a low level of vacuum, which actually considerably reduces the amount of aerosol dispersion. This has been proved by the studies that uh, it can reduce the dispersion up to 97%. This was introduced by one of our, uh, uh, one of the artists, Mr. Felix Koshit, uh, who's also with us today in the panel. So now we have uh, completed about all the high flow nasal oxygen and how can it be used. So I would like to share two cases with all of you. So I, we had a case, which is a 27 year old female patient. Uh, she came with complaints of cough since three days, fever, myalgia, four days, dyspnea, and also was RT and was PCR positive since three days and was in home isolation. So she has no comorbidities. She is non-alcoholic, but has a smoking history for three years, a body mass index of 20. So on arrival, we noticed that she had a very low saturation with 82%. She was tachycardic, she was tachypneic, and her blood pressure was 140 by 95. So only on the management of the oxygen therapy part, we started with a nasal cannula of four liters. And then we noted that the saturation wasn't improving. We, we escalated it to high concentration mask with 10 liters of uh, oxygen. Still, it was not giving much improvement. There was still tachypneper. So we decided to start with high flow nasal cannula. We started with 100% FiO2 with 40 liters per minute. We noticed that the saturation improved to 96% and the patient's respiratory rate settled to 30 we instructed the patient to lie in prone position. And after gradually assessing the ROCS index, we found that there was an upward trend of improvement. So the chest X-ray of this particular patient at the day one of initiation of high flow nasal cannula was more of a COVID-19 picture. And at day nine, when we stopped high flow nasal cannula with, we've noticed that there was a considerable improvement of uh, X-ray. And also with strict prone position protocol, also it has helped this patient to improve. In my second case, I would like to discuss is a 46 year old male who came to the emergency department with cough and sore throat since two days. He had fever and myalgia for two days. Dyspnea was there for since two hours and he was PCR positive with home isolation for a day. So because he had severe dyspnea, he came to the hospital. He's a known hypertensive uh, with some medications. He's a non-smoker. He, he has complaints of seasonal asthma, but is not on any regular medication. On arrival, he had a saturation of 75. He was severely tachycardic and tachypneic, and his blood pressure was 130 by 80. So on the oxygen therapy management, we started him initially on 40% venturi face mask. We gave because he was severely wheezing at that time bronchodilators were administered. We noted that in uh, 15 to 20, 30 minutes that his saturation wasn't improving, it was still at 84. We escalated it to non-rebreathing mask with 12 liters of oxygen. Then since there was not improvement, he was still complaining of breathlessness. We started him on high flow nasal cannula. Initially 100% with 40 liters, but then we escalated to 60 liters per minute. We noted that the saturation improved up to 92% and his respiratory rate started to settle down. We instructed him to lie on prone position and on an assessment of ROCS index, we found that there was a gradual improvement on the ROCS index value. So his chest X-ray at the time of admission was typical features of COVID-19. And on the day seven, when we stopped high flow nasal cannula and switched him to a non rebreather mask, there was improvement with his uh, chest X-ray and also in his clinical features and he was uh, comfortable with non rebreather mask. So in order in, to summarize, uh, as we know, COVID-19 has taken a big toll over the healthcare system all around the world. High flow nasal oxygen has shown to improve the outcome of COVID-19 patients, basically in mild to moderate cases. High flow nasal oxygen also reduces the endotracheal intubation. Make sure that you should always maintain a level three PP protection because this device is actually considered as an aerosol generating procedure. Thank you.
So I'm open for questions. Uh, I request the participants to kindly post your questions in the question answer session or the chat box. The panelists will answer your queries at the earliest. So uh, next up, we have an interesting session on non-invasive ventilation strategies and techniques. So the session will be taken by Ms. Rujuda Bagade. Ms. Rujuda has completed her bachelor's in respiratory therapy program from Symbiosis Institute of Health Sciences and master's in adult respiratory care from Manipal Academy of Higher Education. She has been working in the front lines of COVID care since the very beginning at SL Raheja Hospital, Mumbai. She is one among the first batch of uh, fellowship scholars at IARC in adult respiratory care, adult critical care, FARC ACC. So, with this introduction, I hand over the podium to you, madam. Uh, just a second. Audience, please bear with us. Uh, I request all the uh, participants uh, to post any queries in your chat box or in the question answer session. The panelists will return with your answers at the earliest. Okay. Am I audible? Yes, you are. You may continue. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for the delay, and uh, thank you so much, Bhai sir, for that uh, introduction. And I'm uh, extremely glad and extremely privileged uh, to, you know, present here today, especially uh, in front of my own seniors and faculty members from uh, uh, Manipal Academy of Higher Education. So, uh, without wasting much time, we'll quickly move into our session on non-invasive ventilation its strategies and techniques in COVID-19. Uh, I have a few disclosures to make. I have no affiliation, financial, or institutional benefits or conflicts of interest to disclose. Some of the views expressed in this presentation are subjective to the evidence-based practices and anecdotal experiences that are currently available in the literature. Also, one important thing I'd like to mention is uh, one size doesn't fit all. And I know like many of you might today be you know, uh, looking forward to my presentation carefully to understand about non-invasive ventilation. But one thing you must remember is you might have to tailor your management principles according to each patient because uh, it, this might work for most of the patients, but uh, as in COVID, it, it differs from patient to patient. So you might have to tailor them according to each individual treatment. So uh, we'll going on with the objectives throughout my session, I'll take you through what is the non-invasive ventilation, why it should be used in COVID-19. And uh, the most common question which most of us uh, here might have is if it is safe in COVID-19 and what about its uh, associated risk factors and complications to the healthcare professionals due to their aerosol generation. A little bit about helmet interfaces and make self cloning some tips and uh, about when using non-invasive ventilation in COVID patients, and uh, a little bit in brief about when you can intubate a patient on COVID-19. So before I move on, uh, we know that the COVID-19 pandemic has, has hit us since almost a year right now, with India becoming the second highest country with number of positive cases. And with this increased uh, surge in number of cases, we need to you know, uh, get into effective treatment strategies for better outcomes. But it is what is important for us to understand is not all these patients you know, that land up into worsening disease conditions. Some of them land up into uh, COVID pneumonia and might require oxygen therapy and other escalator therapies like our high-flown nasal cannula or our non-invasive ventilation. 
I suppose most of us know about the clinical presentation of COVID-19 patients, but just to keep all of us on the same page, I'll quickly brush through uh, the clinical presentation of patients with COVID-19 as they are categorized into first is your asymptomatic group, which do not have any clinical signs and symptoms. They have normal CT scans, but are tested positive for RT-PCR. Then you have the mild group of patients who uh, show some fever, have fatigue or myalgia, uh, cold, uh, cough, sore throat, funny nose, sneezing, et cetera. These, might also, uh, these patients might also show some gastrointestinal symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, or abdominal pain. And then you have the moderate group of patients you know, who show, uh, start to show some signs of uh, clinical signs of uh, pneumonia, COVID pneumonia. Uh, and uh, they might have uh, some, they might, they require oxygen, they might show some respiratory distress, some wheeze. And uh, they are, these are the patients wherein you can see some or some amount of uh, ground glass opacities on your chest, chest x-rays. And then you have your severe group of patients wherein there is clinical deterioration and they land up in your, the typical patients which land up in our ICU in respiratory distress with uh, severe hypoxemia saturations less than 90%. And these are the patients who develop into ARDS. And then you have your critical group of patients who have uh, may present with shock, COVID encephalopathies, myocardial injuries, or heart, uh, heart failures due to the COVID. And uh, they might also uh, land up in sepsis, septic shocks, and are, and are usually intubated on mechanical ventilation. And usually develop uh, your multi-organ dysfunction syndrome, that's your MODs and might have a uh, mortality. So these group of patients have high mortality. So uh, as we know about, uh, most of us might require not going through into it, but uh, about the CT scans, we know that um, based upon the each lung involvement, the CT scans, uh, lobe involvement CT scans are calculated. And this might just give us some hint as to uh, when tailoring our management strategies with patients, uh, when we have this as our background, that are the HRCT scans with uh, less than eight scores being the mild group of patients and patients in moderate group having scores between nine to 15 and patients with severe scores having a score of more than 15. So uh, we are aware about this hypoxemia concept coming into of late into these patients with COVID-19. When these patients ex uh, seem to be extremely comfortable, even though they are hypoxemic, they might not have any signs of tachypnea or are not in respiratory distress. But uh, they are, these are the usually group of patients who, you know, you really don't know. I mean, we have literally burnt our fingers with especially these group of patients where you feel that these patients are very comfortable and you just keep them on oxygen therapy and they deteriorate quickly. And by the time you intubate them, they are, uh, you have lost them in a few, they just crash. So this, that is one thing, but also it is important to not only treat our tachypnea because it is uh, due to a lot of reasons because of a lot of uh, physical and chemical changes going on into our body, the uh, emotional changes, uh, the irritant receptors and uh, the stretch receptors in the juxta capillary receptors, which a lot of factors which can cause this tachypnea. So that can be those group who might just be tachypneic, but might not be something is, as you term is as in respiratory distress. So when you say that your patient is in respiratory distress is when the patient is tachypneic, yes, with a respiratory rate of more than 20, but it should be supplemented with nasal flaring, use of his accessory muscles like his sternocleidomastoid muscles and his abdominal muscles for respiration. So see, we, we know that uh, this increased work of breathing and tachypnea is a response to hypoxia. So what, as Jitansu mentioned in his men uh, presentation before, rightly, is that oxygen, just giving the patients oxygen is not the treatment. It might just treat your hypoxia, but it is not the treatment for respiratory distress. So that is when we need to have strategies which will aim to increase our valvular ventilation. So uh, we'll move on quickly to our uh, non-invasive ventilation and this is where you need to, you know, properly trailer and initiate the patient on, on invasive ventilation. When you see these kinds of things, I'll, I'll of course take you through that. So the most important concern now is about uh, the dilemma that all of us as healthcare professionals are into is uh, if non-invasive ventilation is safe in COVID and the associated risk factors 
and earlier it was also the case where if it was really helping in patients with covid 19 diseases so we have enough studies where in uh, uh, it is shown to say that non invasive ventilation is effective in reducing your mortality in terms of increasing uh, reducing the in, uh, duration of icu stay in terms of uh, patients not requiring mechanical ventilation and when you you know when you're not intubating these patients you are automatically you know avoiding the associated complications associated with mechanical ventilation we know there are a huge lot of complications which are also come into place when you actually go ahead with uh, intubating these patients so we have enough studies uh, which uh, show that there is improvement of uh, non in improvement in patients with niv supportive with our high flow nasal cannulas so we know now yes we have studies to show that an non invasive ventilation is useful so let's into see about how it is and how can we use it so simple definition it is the def delivery of respiratory support via a fire face mask or our helmet and uh, therefore it eliminates the need of an endotracheal airway it achieves comparative physiological benefits uh, to our conventional mechanical ventilation by reducing the work of breathing and thereby improving our gas exchange so this uh, is needed to reduce your work of breathing and also the uh, increased o2 demand and also your complications as i mentioned with intubation So it involves basically giving two supports uh, you, to make it very simple. Your non-invasive ventilation will have two basic modes. One is your CPAP mode and your BiPAP mode. So your CPAP mode will give you a cont continuous positive airway pressure throughout your breathing cycle. That is throughout your inspiration and exhalation. Whereas your BiPAP mode will be having different levels. That is your IPAP and your EPAP, and the difference of which is your pressure support. so let's move into the physiological benefits of non invasive ventilation one is it improves your alveolar ventilation to reverse the respiratory acidosis because this is uh, uh, hypercarbia is quite common in patients with uh, the uh, this respiratory failure and uh, recruits the alveoli and helps increase your functional respiratory capacity to reverse the hypoxia it reduces the work of breathing and improves your gas exchange Uh, so uh, let's move into the basic advantages and disadvantages associated with uh, the non-invasive ventilation. First advantage is yes, it is non-invasive, so you are completely uh, not not does not require much skill and all. It's non-invasive, but tolerated by patients as compared to invasive. It is obviously nullifying the complications with uh, an artificial airway with you inserting an endotracheal tube. it is nullifying all those complications it is improving your patient comfort and you are maintaining your oral patency wherein the patient can speak he can talk he can mild some amount of disconnection and he can eat and he is well oriented to the uh, to the background and to the atmosphere within uh, it reduces of course the need of sedation as i mentioned the, you might have to uh, sedate and then you know the orientation is lost of the patient the disadvantages yes you're not only with non invasive you're not only ventilating the trachea your lungs but there is some amount of gastric distension you have your air leak which is probably one of the thing might much more most of you watching me might agree uh, that the non invasive ventilations we have a lot of uh, air leaks with the, and we have face a lot of problems with slight disconnections and leaks and the alarm uh, the, the ventilators keep alarming So this is one common thing that we all face, and of course we have these facial necrosis that comes into picture with patients, uh, wherein the, because of high pressure sores, and plus with COVID you are telling these patients to sleep uh, sleep prone. So imagine the amount of pressure uh, going in and causing the facial skin necrosis to these patients. Uh, of course, in patients who are not able to protect their airway, uh, it it might no it might just be in this major disadvantage, and the patient might just. Uh, crash off, and in patients with having claustrophobia, it might be difficult for them to, you know, tolerate or uh, get adjusted to the therapy. Moving on to the indications with patients with severe shortness of breath, even at rest, if their respiratory rate uh, is more than twenty-five, and they are in distress, with the keeping into mind the factors that I mentioned in my earlier slide, wherein they are having they are using the accessory muscles, are having nasal flaring, and are having shortness of breath. and they have failed their your conventional oxygen therapy 
out of your HFNCs for that matter. So these patients continue to deteriorate and are not improving despite your conventional O2 therapy, despite putting them on HFNC. And they have continuously high oxygen requirements of more than even for 40, 50. Or some patients might even require 60 to 70% of O2. And this is the time wherein you think that these patients might benefit from non-invasive ventilation and you can give them a try. Uh, a saturation of less than 92%, yes, but I would mention here that we might have to, you know, uh, uh, this target, uh, we might have to tailor our target saturation from patient to patient, depending upon the lung condition and uh, depending upon his, uh, you know, comorbid condition. So we might have to target, but generally, as a standard, between 92 to 94% target saturation with a P by F ratio. That is your partial pressure of oxygen by, by your FiO2 ratio of less than 200. Now, in COVID, most of us might have uh, observed that we see a P by F of less than even 100 for that matter. So we need to keep that as our, our clinical marker uh, and when we are monitoring these patients and uh, when we uh, tailor and we try to think about either escalating or de-escalating or de -escalating our therapies. And of course, our uh, CT severity scores, which I think it can play an important role in deciding where, where you, you see huge lung involvements with scores of 22, 23, with almost 70, more than 75% lung involvements. These are the patients, if uh, mostly might require, as per my uh, scope of practice, they require non-invasive ventilation, and it is better not to delay and give them some amount of fee because it uh, this is going to cause some amount of recruitability. And once you uh, see your P by F ratios and your target saturations, and if you see after initiating your therapy, you see an improvement in this by almost say 15 to 30 percent uh, after your initiation uh, within an hour or so, or more than an hour of one or two, two hours, you might say that yes, the patient is ha has a recruitable lung. So in these patients, you might uh, you might need to you know start off with non-invasive ventilation and accordingly tailor your management. Contraindications, of course, in patients with a very poor uh, Glasgow coma scale of less than even eight, patients with partial trauma, uh, having uh, you know having burns or any anatomical disorders that can prevent you know giving putting that mask on your uh, face. Patients with an upper GI bleed, patients in the respiratory arrest with unstable hemodynamics, hemodynamics, and of course, patients who are not able to protect their airway. So this is an example of a CT scan, which uh, I, I mentioned earlier, and in, wherein you can see there is a huge lung involvement in these patients. And probably you might think if these patients are not improving well earlier, you don't rather uh, waste a lot of time in uh, giving them trials of your uh, conventional auto therapy and rather shift on to your non-invasive ventilation. So I mentioned earlier we have basically two pressures, uh, two pre pre seat modes of your non-invasive. One is your CPAP, and one the other one is your BiPAP mode. So your CPAP is your continuous positive airway pressure, which gives your PEEP, which is equal to your PEEP. And it is the constant pressure which has been given throughout the breathing cycle, that is during your inspiration as well as during your exhalation. And it is improving your oxygenation. It is decreasing your hypoxia by, you know, imp do, improving your alveolar recruitment and also reducing the interpulmonary shunt that can occur. So uh, usually in patients with uh, pulmonary edema, with, with pneumonia and having some signs of some, showing some signs of symptoms, of respiratory distress, you initiate these patients of uh, CPAP and also in patients with of obstructive sleep apnea. And then you have your BiPAP, which is your bi-level positive airway pressure, which gives your IPAP as well as your EPAP, which is basically you're giving two pressures. One is at your inspiration and exhalation. And the difference between which is your pressure support. So uh, it is uh, your IPAP will, of course, reduce your oxygen demand and reduce your work of dreaming, uh, work of breathing. And your EPAP is going to improve your functional epistodial capacity and your saturation levels. Uh, in this, it can be used in patients with respiratory failure and or uh, refractory patients with refractory hypoxemia as in with COVID and who are not improving and are in failure, showing distress and in patients with COPD. So I hope uh, you can see this picture wherein you know you can actually see the change in pressure in the, the patient who is spontaneously breathing. And uh, say this patient is on a CPAP mode wherein he is at a constant pressure of say 10, to say 10 centimeters of water. 
so this is pressure is going to be maintained throughout your inhalation as and your exhalation whereas with bipap you set your epap as uh, your ipap as well as your epap and the difference is uh, what is your pressure support we'll quickly move on to some of the uh, niv interfaces so we have our nasal interface uh, which is uh, most commonly used in patients with uh, OSC or an home pap are quite comfortable, better tolerated, uh, but not mo most commonly used in our uh, hospital setup. What we more commonly use is the oral nasal mask, which is uh, well suited for the patient, and you know uh, it is well suited for patients and easily available. Then you have your full face mask where it covers your entire face, but this can cause, uh, is also has associated complications with like, uh, obviously some patients might have irritation and some might not tolerate a huge face, full face mask on their face. So it might be a little bit irritable. And then you have the helmet interface, which, you know, nullifies all your uh, questions that we used to have with uh, the aerosol generating generation with respect to non-invasive ventilation and it's a effect on uh, healthcare professional. So uh, your helmet interface is probably uh, the answer and it, it is should be widely used if possible. Not always, not all hospitals and uh, our hospital setups are having this setup, but if you have, you should be using it. <clears throat> so I'll quickly take you through the uh, helmet interface and, uh, you know, because I feel not much of us are using. And as I have been using it in my personal uh, practice since over a year now, I thought I should share my experience with this, uh, which might help a, a lot of you, you know, if you're planning to use an interface. So this is an interface which is non-invasive, comfortable, versatile, and lightweight. Uh, it is all, almost nullifying our uh, concerns as about the generation, aerosol generated, because it is constrained within the helmet. So it is healthcare, safe for the healthcare professionals. Patients are better comfortable uh, with this uh, with this kind of interface, and they have, there is better compliance. Uh, they are very very compliant to uh, when you put them on a helmet, as and we have seen it ourselves. In patients, you're putting them on a nasal mask, and while patients on helmet, they are very comfortable and more compliant to the therapy. Very less leakage or almost no, so it's improving your efficiency of the therapy because there is no loss of peep as with your uh, other mask, wherein there is a lot of leak. So there is there are minimal disconnections required because these interfaces have built in uh, valves for you know put, taking off for feeding the patient for temporary access to the patient or has small valves to you know take off your valve tubes uh, if any and you know there is minimal disconnections that is required in this place adequate peep delivered as I said no like no less very less leakage so you know you don't have disconnections and this so it is going to be adequate delivery. Uh, of course, the the major thing of you know pressure ulcers developing in this group of patients due to uh, the oral nasal mask or the other traditional face mask. So th that has been nullified here. It reduces the requirement of intubation and mechanical ventilation as patients are more compliant uh, to the to the therapy. They might they there is a required that they might just improve drastically and. You might just have to not require at all. These patients might not at all require the need of intubation or mechanical ventilation, and of course reduces their mortality. Uh, so uh, this is just a brief about uh, uh, you, how you attach the patient uh, to the helmet when you remove the ports and attach the arm straps. And I'll not go much into the detail. If this presentation is going to be with you, we can obviously go through the presentation uh, to this uh, pictures. And it is self-explanatory how you attach the patient uh, to the patients on uh, on helmet interface. So as I mentioned about uh, the uh, access ports uh, that is there with these patients, wherein so there is no requirement for. Uh, Disconnection. So this is one wherein you can access the patient's face for feeding or for you know sips of water. And there is another access pose that is a sealed access for your catheters. For example, right here, respiratory tube. Uh, moving, moving on to the initiating the therapy, some special considerations uh, that you need to keep in place is uh, mind is use your single limb circuits that uh, are not recommended uh, recommended in this group of patients. 
because you are creating an intentional leak even if you are using it with a leak port or with an insulation valve you are going to disperse the result or the particles outside so uh, you do not use the single limb circuit you go for your dual limb circuit and uh, also keep in mind that as you increase your pressures you know the leak is going to increase so it is better that you go for your dual limb circuits when using your older nasal mask if uh, helmet interfaces are not available with your a particular organization you make sure you use the non vented masks only uh, use of bacterial filters between the interface and the exhalation port is necessary one thing is you keep the machine ready before connecting switch on do all the connections and settings and then connect to the patient uh so when you start the therapy or to, uh, when you initiate the pa patients on this therapy you usually start with 100% fio2 and then target uh titrate according to your target saturations when you have achieved your target saturations you can think of uh, escalate deescalating your oxygen requirement and also if the patient is uh, continuously having increasing uh, o2 requirements then you can consider as escalating the therapy to either your you might have to think of intubating also starting this patients with a minimal uh, uh by a basic uh, cp of say 5 to 8 cm of water is uh, is uh, appropriate and then you might have to add in uh, and uh, you know tailor and go higher as high as your 10 to 12 cm of water and if this patient still remains to be in respiratory distress and you don't see any improvements you might have to add a uh, try adding a pressure support and keep adjusting your setting ventilatory settings to achieve a target minute ventilation and your target tidal volumes uh when uh, considering when you are trying to wean these patients of uh, your uh, of niv you can try and uh, giving intermittent uh, trials of niv and your hfnc and then go into your uh, trials of uh, with your conventional o2 therapy uh, practices so what we are following as as you as you are putting this patients on non invasive ventilation and then you try uh you've weaned off you've got them to say very minimal supports and very minimal auto requirements this is this is the right time you can switch them off to an hypo nasal cannula and then gradually taper it off so a quick algorithm of uh, managing this patient so uh, patients with hypoxemia if they are you start them on your conventional auto therapies if they are responders uh, well and good but if they are not you can consider for hypo nasal cannulas and try if uh, if they are still not responders you then consider your non invasive uh, ventilation with your cpap and then you uh, try and adjust uh, your settings and you can you know assist it with your proning your self proning and uh, once uh, these patients are proned i mean we have seen and all of us know that self proning or wake proning is uh, doing wonders and it is helping a lot in this group of patients so you try and uh, prone these patients with non invasive ventilation they sure still have some benefits but if you it is if it doesn't show any improvement you might have to go ahead with mechanical ventilation so i mentioned about uh, avail uh, awake proning there in uh, it is there is a lot of evidence available that uh, awake proning is going to help these patients are not only proning only also you are uh, keeping them in the right lateral and left lateral positions and changing the position frequently is going to affect this group of patients so try and prone these patients uh, as a supportive therapy to your non invasive ventilation so i'll take you through a, a case uh, wherein a, a patient who was a 65 year old male with no comorbid comorbidities he came to our icu uh, on an early morning shift on uh, with an nr game from the wards and the saturation was 85% was in severe respiratory distress was extremely tachypneic and by tachypnea i mean his respiratory rate going up to about 45 50 liters per minute he was using his accessory muscles was tachycardic had a very bad ct scan almost uh, his ct score was 22 by 25 means almost a majority of his lung was involved immediately we put him on helmet and he was on helmet uh, for around 4 5 days and we started him with off with 100% fio2 with peep of around 5 to 8 cm of water and we proned him one thing i would mention here is starting these patients on mild sedation like your dexmedetomidine or fentanyl uh, improves their compliance uh, to the therapy so uh, it is better you start them on mild sedation and uh, when you are uh, 
and then go ahead with your therapy so you know we we tried and tried reading him all we had several fa- reigning failures and we almost you know that time was the time when we thought and we were in the phase where when you as soon as you intubate you would lose the patient so we tried and ourselves hold back and this is very atypical because not all patients who are on patients or on 100% of the fire to will come out yes but we have had some few atypical two three cases wherein they have slightly started showing improvements day 5 day 6 wherein and they have uh, we have tried to and when we started you know reducing their disconnections by starting them on uh, total parental nutrition cloning them on uh, starting them on sedation they became compliant and slowly they have come out of uh, the helmet into pay helmet and then you would try try to taper them off with intermittent hypnosis cannula trial and then one important thing is mobilization very important in uh, in patients uh with in the icu because um, it might feel difficult it is obviously going to require a lot of expertise but uh, it is very important to mobilize for early liberation from the icu and then we gradually were able to take him off and iv we continued him on hfnc and slowly tapered him to our uh, uh, nrv and your hudson and your navy prongs and he went home after nearly one one and a half months with almost on him go to with 1.2 liters but this is something very atypical wherein you when we when we say that you know do not delay your intubation when it is time and you have to intubate them because it is going to increase the, the chances of their mortality and all but we do have some cases wherein when we tried and held our nerves back and tried not to intubate them we did see some mortality a benefit quickly take you through a, a, a small thing wherein you went to decide to intubate basically you know your patient the best it should be based on your clinical gist told which is of course supplemented with your vitals like your respiratory rate your saturations your efforts and your imaging senses should not be slowly based on your respiratory rate and the best metric would be your fatigue and of course your increased work of breathing patients with altered mental status and agitating which will prevent them from the application of niv and then there is no set up set up of set up of oxygen there and you despite you know they being on very high uh, fio2 and cloning you do see and the benefit in your saturations you might have to go, go ahead and early intubate them so some take home messages uh, it is helpful in patients in order to reduce their survival rate it reduce the uh, sorry increase their survival rate reduce the instances of patients going on ventilators and thereby prevent it associated complications uh elmets interfaces by far and i personally practice have been the best to improve patient outcomes when as in with, with better compliance and if not available you can use your oral nasal masks uh, with proper seal and proper use of your hepa bacterial filters uh, awake self proning very important with which we need to have proper patient counseling is necessary for them to you know better compliant and to have better outcomes so i hope i've left you with a better understanding of the use of non invasive ventilation So thank you very much for your patient listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am, for delivering such an interesting talk. Uh, yeah. Uh, if I may chime in, would that be okay? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, we are running a little short of time, but uh, you can make a quick comment always. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Please, please go ahead. We are uh, running okay, short of time. Okay. Thank you. So, Rajuta, I just wanted to thank you for a fantastic presentation. It was really great. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of very minor observations. Okay, one is um, I know you mentioned CPAP and BiPAP, which is great, but in, in the bi-level scheme of things, pressure non-invasive pressure control plays plays a very very important role in management of patients with ARDS. uh because uh by utilizing non invasive pressure control in in um your covid patients you can control your mean airway pressure much better and you can control patient demand much better than just relying on traditional bi level because with traditional bi level if patient becomes very tachypneic with covid um they can terminate the breath prematurely and pull in very small volumes and at the same time uh bring down their mean airway pressure now contrary to that if you have somebody just on a bi level and not on pressure control according to gatanoni and marini there are two different phenotypes with your uh, covid patients phenotype l 
which much which has a lot of microembolism and a lot of um, and, and very good lung compliance, if you will. And phenotype H is more of a traditional ARDS kind of a lung. So if you have someone with good lung compliance, these patients potentially can pull in huge tidal volumes without being in pressure control. And that can ultimately result in severe um, value trauma. So when, if you do wind up intubating them down the road, not only that they have a lot of microembolism and being extremely sick from COVID, but now a couple of days later, they have this tremendous value problem, all right? So that's one observation. And I also wanted to mention uh, about the helmet. Uh, helmet is a very, um, very nice, very sexy topic, if you will, uh, in a lot of countries, but, uh, couple of things to be mindful about the helmet is that with helmet, active humidification is very problematic because if you're utilizing heated wire circuit, it fogs up the helmet and then you cannot see the patient and patient cannot see you. And you really, in COVID, a lot of the time secretions are really very problematic. And the last thing you want to do is to provide non-heated humidification. And now instead of dry secretions, instead of something that is reminiscent of concrete, you're making it into a reinforced concrete, if you will. You know, so that's, that's very problematic in terms of humidification. Also in a very tachypnic patient, there is a significant delay, especially if you're using helmet not as a CPAP, but any kind of bi-level mode, there is a significant delay between the time that the patient tries to trigger the demand valve on a, on a system to open up the demand valve to get the breath versus when the system is actually delivering the breath. And you need to be mindful of patients with glaucoma because if, if somebody has glaucoma, uh, utilizing helmet will increase ocular pressures and can cause severe ocular hypertension. That, that's all I wanted to say, thank you. Thank you, sir, for your valuable comments. Thank uh, you. Yes. So next up is a session on the topic aerosolized medications in COVID-19 patients. So the session will be taken by Ms. Madhura Gauri Shivade. She is the Associate Vice President of Indian Association of Respiratory Care and the Co-Vice Chair of Indian Academy of Respiratory Care. She is the Associate Editor of the Indian Journal of Respiratory Care. She graduated with a BSc from Symbiosis Institute of Health Sciences, Pune, and MSc from Rush University College of Health Sciences, Chicago, USA. She has been an RT for more than 10 years, a visiting faculty and guest lecturer for RT programs. She has worked in the USA in the neonatal pediatric ICU of Rush University Medical Center. She also has worked at Chess Research Foundation, Pune. Her personal interest and expertise is in research and education in respiratory therapy. She has several publications to her name. Over to you, ma'am. Yes. Thank you, Vinay. Thank you so much for your kind introduction. Thank you for everyone, uh, everyone who is still here with us, who has joined us a little late, and uh, especially my panelists and my senior faculty members who are here uh, listening uh, to all our uh, presentations. Um, so I understand I have a little less time than uh, um, um, the other presentation present presenters, which is completely fine by me. Yes, I'm going to try and finish a short, short presentation um, sooner than the others. Uh, so without wasting time, uh, let me begin if my computer, yes, all right. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, um, just a generalized um, a presentation on aerosol therapy, um, inhaler therapy, as some of you may know. Um, um, so I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Uh, I have no financial benefits to talk about any of the devices that I am talking, going to talk about today. Um, I would like to mention that this presentation has been inspired by Dr. Arzuari. Her work, her uh, uh, articles, as well as her presentation that she made for us on Monday. Um, so I've sort of fine-tuned uh, based on what she presented. All the images that are taken are from the internet or from publications, and I have uh, cited them. Uh, as per where I've taken that from. Okay, so um, 
COVID-19 has been on our heads for the past two years. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a uh, unfortunate event that we saw in this past few months that, you know, so many patients suffered, so many patients died. Um, it's a contagious infection. Everybody knows that. And it is, it can pass through, it can be transferred from uh, one person to the other, you know, like this. And it causes a lot of, a whole host of issues. But uh, what, as RTs, we look for, what we care about, apart from the uh, respiratory distress that we see, um, you know, is, is how much it has affected the lungs, the pneumonia, the inflammation, the mucus production, et cetera. So aerosols are commonly given for our patients of COVID, um, um, is, you know, to relieve, to help uh, sort of be, them to be able to breathe better. Of course, our patients who already have asthma, who already have COPD and come with a COVID-19 infection, um, they also, you know, continue to get their uh, uh, infection, uh, their uh, treatment that uh, they have been handling or they have been taking. <clears throat> right. So I've just uh, closed my uh, uh, video because I have my internet is a little unstable. I will join back soon, but I'm sure you all can hear me. So what is aerosol therapy? It's obviously all of us know delivery of inhaled aerosolized dose of drugs given uh, typically through inhaler, inhaler devices. And it is very important for not only COVID, but other diseases also because one, it's safe. You can safely use inhaler uh, or aerosol therapy. Two, uh, yes, it acts fast. It starts acting within seconds to minutes. It's very effective and a very low dosage is required for you to get the desired result that you look for or you're looking for. In general, you see, uh, you use aerosol therapy or you, you must have seen people use aerosol therapy for all of these reasons, namely, you know, you've got bronchodilation for your asthma, COPD, uh, some, uh, some patients get it for their inflammation. Um, ventilated patients also get it, you know, when they have increased air resistance, they have air issues, they have healing issues. Uh, of course, when you need to deliver specialized uh, medicines like your antibiotics or your um, uh, Dordes Alpha for your cystic fibrosis patients, insulin, surfactant, all of these things can be delivered and can be uh, aerosol therapy route can be used for that. In India, now this list that I'm presenting to you here is uh, the various drugs that are available in the inhaler nebulization or an inhaler format to be given to your uh, patients. So you've got your bronchodilators, uh, inhaled corticosteroids, you've got your combinations, you've got your uh, mucolytics, antibiotics, etc. India is also blessed. I you know how blessed India is when it comes to the types of uh, inhaler devices that we have. And yes, we have all of these available. And I would also like to mention that these are available at a much, much cheaper rate uh, than, you know, if, if I consider it with the US or if I consider it with UK. So for, to give you an example, uh, um, Astelin, which is al, uh, salbutamol, uh, meter dose inhaler costs about 100 rupees. 100 rupees is less than $2. Whereas I'm sure uh, my colleagues here will tell me that it costs much, much more for a patient to get them there. So again, coming back, India is very blessed. So, but can you use all of these devices for uh, COVID-19? What are the different types you can use? And why is it that you cannot use certain uh, types? Um, I will not go into the depths of COVID-19. All of us as have been listening and monitoring and handling, we already know uh, the issues that uh, the, ba the basis of the disease. But uh, just to give you a small overview is you, this is a, a, a disorder that is transferred through droplet airborne transmission. And on top of that, when you are, you are using an aerosol generating uh, procedure, which is going to cause more aerosol, uh, you are likely, uh, you know, uh, creating an environment that is going to be highly, highly infectious, not only for the patient, but for the people around them. Because the SARS-CoV-2 uh, is transmitted through droplets and it is viable in the air for a very long time. So as clinicians, it is important for us to utilize uh, 
uh, strategies that will give the desired results but um, you know not cause so much of an infection or not cause so much of an aerosol uh, in the surroundings so we should use proper guidelines uh, proper contact precautions and uh, uh, proper the uh, appropriate delivery device so what we will look at today is one is the types of devices that you can use and when to use them. and this uh, i have taken help from dr uh, arzuari's presentation that she made for us that day so you have your pressurized meter dose inhaler now this is a simple uh, as the common man in india call it as a pump um, that has you know you got your inhaler uh, you got your aerosol drug mixed along with propellants and formulation other formulations that together uh, are delivered through the device but um, when you use it with in a combination with your non static valve holding chambers or in india people commonly call them as non static spacers the combination of this two becomes a good uh, team for you to be able to give the patient uh, the desired drug and why is that is because it is there, there is a lot of research that has already been done and that tells you that when you use a pmdi with a non, uh, with a non static valve spacer or a valve holding chamber it gives you the highest amount of drug deposition and uh, along with that the side effects that it comes along you know it has with it is the least so that is why this combination is known to be the best the second type of uh, delivery device is your dry powder inhaler now as the name suggests the drug comes in a dry powder formulation which is attached to another uh, molecule a dry powder molecule typically you know in india i think we see uh, lactose as the molecule what happens when the patient inhales is that these two molecules separate the lactose molecules is swallowed it sticks to the throat and then it is swallowed by the patient and the medicine then goes you know during inhalation goes to the lower parts of the lungs and the desired effect is achieved and these are the different types of um, uh, uh, devices that are available the third main category uh, is your nebulizers now i will only talk about the two main important ones which are used for covid and one is your jet nebulizer as the name suggests it's simple uh, there is a air jet that passes through the device and it mixes with your covid uh, drug thereby forming an aerosol which give uh, which uh, is then given to the patient and your vibrating mesh nebulizers which are the latest technology in uh, nebulization where you have um, a plate with tiny holes and uh, you add your liquid medicine on uh, in that device that plate or that the whole assembly shakes and with that shaking uh, 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 action tiny aerosol droplets are created and that is what is being given to the patient so um, what uh, so let us begin with when what the, the delivery devices can you use for your spontaneously breathing patients if the patient is able to perform the technique correctly you should use a pressurized meter dose inhaler with a valve holding chamber a non static valve a zero stack uh, chamber or you can also use a dry powder inhaler if the patient is able to generate the inspiratory the high inspiratory flow rate that it requires but if they cannot use it correctly one if the formulation is not available in the format of uh, the drug uh, device two or uh, the patient is not able to generate the high inspiratory flow rate then you can consider using a jet or a vibrating mesh nebulizer remember you should always use a filter the previous speakers have also talked about it use a filter so that uh, you are trying you know trying to contain um, the infection that may spread through the procedure as uh, use a mouth piece so that uh, you know more delivery of drug uh, is ensured now <clears throat> aerosol uh, delivery through a high free, a high flow nasal cannula um, the best thing you can use is your vibrating mesh nebulizer uh, and you connect it to the dry side of the humidifier so right before it is uh, you know the humidification process happens and as shown in the picture here and then you ensure that it is connected with all uh, uh, um, caps and everything plugged in so that there is no leak and you can use it like this for about 28 days 
uh, along with this, as uh, Sanjay has already talked about, you should you can use uh, well-fitted prongs uh, and cover it with a mask only uh, um, till the aerosol uh, uh, treatment process happens. Now there is research that uh, I have looked up that talks about if you lower the rate of your high frequency, uh, high flow nasal cannula during aerosol therapy, more medicine is deposited, more drug goes to the lungs. However, the word of caution here, there are times when our patients tolerate the lower flow. As patients, you need to decide whether the patient can handle this or not. If the patient is able to handle a lower flow rate for some time, then you can definitely uh, think about using low flows of up to 10 liters during the treatment uh, time. And after your treatment is done, ensure that you know you dial back the flow rate to what the patient was initially on. Now this using high flow um, aerosol therapy with high flow is, is a controversial or it's, you know, there are two schools of thoughts. I, I, um, I presented you one school of thought, but I am sure there are other uh, um, arguments or other ways and means that you can uh, carry this forward. I'm open to having this discussion later on, you know, if there are uh, other suggestions that you all can give to the audience, I open it up to the uh, panel who is uh, also present with me here. Okay, now for a patient who is mechanically ventilated, our goal is to keep the circuit intact and to avoid any, you know, breakage of the circuit. One is to not lose the pressure that is generated and two is to not, uh, uh, um, you know, spread the uh, aerosol everywhere. You don't want that. So our goal, again, as I said, is to avoid any leaks. As uh, uh, as we saw in the previous uh, lecture, that if you are, for example, going to use a non-invasive ventilator, um, try and use dual limb sockets. Try and you and cover up the port, the exhalation ports. Try and use filters. So you can use all of these during uh, 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 aerosol therapy as well. <clears throat> if you need to use jet. Uh, so if you're not able to so vibrating mesh, sorry, so vibrating mesh nebulizer is the best thing you can use. But if that is not available, if it is, uh, um, you know, you have to use the other device. Now, again, this is again with a word of caution. You can try using JET. I know in India, we've been using JETs because uh, vibrating mesh is not, it is available everywhere, but not as much as um, it should be. So in that case, um, you need to, there are there is research that is done uh, and they have uh, they've used um, one way valve to the corrugated to the tubings so that uh, that helps with not breaking the circuit and try to keep the um, circuit intact. Now, what are some recommendations? I just have a couple of slides left. Um, one is aerosol therapy should be done only if it is necessary. Don't don't try and prescribe medicine if it is not necessary because the risk of um, the Inspection spreading is more than uh, what you think it is. Always use personal protective equipment that, uh, and always, always follow infectious disease precautions. You've got your contact droplet, uh, airborne, everything. You need to take care of yourself as healthcare workers as well when you are treating your patients. Uh, try and use PMDI with a valve holding chamber if the patient is able to use it. Uh, use filters and mouthpieces for nebulizers wherever you can or always uh, if i may say close the patient's door if the patient is in a separate room if the patient is at home during nebulizer therapy uh, make sure you maintain a six feet or greater distance so that uh, you know you need to give that much space at least while the treatment is going on closed as i said closed system is always the best for you uh, when you're uh, administering uh, aerosol therapy uh, vibrating mesh is the first choice. You should always use that. If you're not able to use that, then you can look, think about using a jet, but it needs to have a valve T piece. I'm not sure if it is available uh, everywhere in India, though. Uh, you, you should always use an additional filter at the expiratory port um, while using uh, while administering aerosol therapy. And make sure, you know, try. I know this is not easy for our country, but uh, if possible, try and have our patient in a separate room or, uh, or a negative pressure room for all the procedures, that's always the best. And if there is no single room available, which is most of the times the scenario in our country, 
at least maintain a one to 1.5 meters distance between the two patients. And if there are curtains, you know, close those curtains, draw those, draw those curtains every time you're doing some sort of a um, procedure. So that was a little overview on aerosol therapy. Aerosol therapy is a very sensitive subject, although we use it every day. Um, so apart from all the references that I have mentioned on all my slides, uh, these are some of the references that you all can uh, definitely uh, refer. There are a few more on the net. Um, so uh, with that, I will close my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, if you all have any questions, please post them in the Q&A uh, box. I will try and answer them. And uh, if anybody would like to add or uh, modify uh, anything that has been said, please, I open the forum to you all. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Madam, for taking such an intriguing session on aerosolized medication and COVID-19. So, thank you, Vinay. So, uh, we will proceed to the inauguration of the two-day e-course shortly. Uh, today, we have with us our chief patron, Dr. G. Arun Maya, Dean, Manipal College of Health Professions, Mahe. And we are honored by the presence of Ms. Kavita Narayan, advisor, HRH for Health Systems at uh, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India. So I request Ms. Pradipa Todur, head of the Department of Respiratory Therapy, Manipal College of Health Professions, Mahe, to welcome the gathering. Thank you, Pinoy. Good evening, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome all the participants for this two-day event on Fundamentals of Respiratory Care in COVID-19, organized by Manipal College of Health Professionals, Mahe Manipal, in association with Indian Association of Respiratory Care. I welcome our Chief Patron, Dr. Arunji Maya, Dean of Manipal College of Health Professionals, to this event. And I also extend a warm welcome to today's guest of honor, Ms. Kavita Narayanan, advisor to the National Human Resources for Health Cell at Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India. A warm welcome to all the national and international speakers, panelists, and IARC fraternity to this two-day's event. A special welcome to Dr. Ram Kumar, sir, who was one of the visionary in starting the respiratory therapy course in India. And I also welcome Dr. Anita Shanoi, who is the editor-in-chief of Indian Association of Re Indian Journal of Respiratory Care, which is an official journal of Indian Association of Respiratory Care. I welcome the IARC President, Dr. Jerry Paul, Associate Vice President, Ms. Madhura Gauri, General Secretary, Mr. Jitin, Academic Chair, Dr. Manjush to this event. And once again, I welcome, I extend a warm welcome to each and everyone, especially the faculty colleagues and students who have attended this event. Warm welcome to all of you. Thank you. And I now request Dr. G. Arun Maya, Dean, Manipal College of Health Professions, Manipal Academy of Higher Education to deliver the keynote. Very good evening to each and every one of you. The President of the Indian Association of Respiratory Care, Dr. Jerry Paul, Dr. Kavita Narayan, Technical Advisor, Health Human Resource for the Health System, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India, Mr. Jitin K. Sridharan, General Secretary, Indian Association of Respiratory Care. Dr. Manjusha Karthik, Chairman, Indian Academy of Respiratory Care and the Chair Curriculum Board of the IARC. Dr. Ramkumar sir, Ram Kumar, uh, Ram Kumar sir and as well as Dr. Anita Shanai. Ms. Pratiba, Head of the Department of Respiratory Therapy of Manipal College of Health Profession. Mr. Binay, Vinoy, the senior faculty of the Department of Respiratory Therapy and also the EC member of the Indian Association of Respiratory Care. The delegates from various parts of the country and the globe, 
all the office bearer of the indian association of respiratory care and all my dear colleagues once again a very cordial welcome to each and every one of you on behalf of the manipal college of health profession is the constituent unit of the manipal academy of higher education a deemed to be university with the institute of eminent status by the government of india and also on behalf of the indian academy of respiratory care who is hosting this uh, e series of lecture today i on this occasion i would like to appreciate and contribute the the role of respiratory therapist on this pandemic from 2019 december onwards the covid 19 pandemic have made a lot of challenges in the healthcare system or even to the general population respiratory therapist being an integral part of the and the important uh, member of the healthcare system played an important role in the care of these patients with the varied pathologies and the complication so uh, especially in our hospital our respiratory therapists play a significantly an important role in managing the patients with the covid with various complications on this occasion i would like to compliment congratulate and thank all the respiratory therapists across the globe for your excellent services for the human being the manipal college of health profession i just wanted to highlight one or two important points to all our delegates is the the first full fledged and the largest institution in the country for providing quality educations in allied health science and we are having more than 71 program students from 23 countries and offering at four campus manipal mangalore bangalore and even manipal tata medical college medical college jamshedpur the department of respiratory therapy is one of the strongest and the vibrant department of the our institution the department was established in 1995 under the leadership of our dr ram kumar sir in collaborations with the loma linda university i am very pleased to inform to you that this is the first institutions or the university in the country to offer the bachelor of respiratory therapy programs in 1995 in india and then the further the department is strengthened by dr anita shanai a former head of the department of the respiratory therapy as well as the professor and head of the depart former head of the department of anesthesiology and further strengthened by our own various alumni including dr somi and all other senior faculties now the department is doing extremely good under the leadership of ms pratibha as well as the senior faculty like binay and all the faculty members the the most importantly the two days of e series of this webinar the fundamentals of respiratory care in covid 19 the indian academy of respiratory care along with the team of mchp meticulously planned various topics which are very relevant and appropriate in the current context i also would like to compliment all the speakers from various part of the globe for accepting the invitations and delivering an imp- interesting and the important sessions during this e series we have with us very eminent personality of the government of india dr kavita narayan the technical advisor health human resources for the health system the ministry of health and family welfare government of india she is one of the youngest and the first indian fellow of the american college of healthcare executives fellowship award and we all even though she is very young very dynamic and we call her as the architect in the revolutionary changes of the health systems in india like various policies for the various disciplines or the professionals including the medical nursing and the allied health profession for especially for the allied health professional she played a very significant and an important role and bringing up the both important aspect one is the the regulations and as well as bringing the uniformity in the curriculum for providing educations in the allied health system allied health prof- uh, science from 2012 onwards we the manipal college of health profession being one of the first and the first led institutions in the country we have been working very closely with the madam and the all the other office bearer of the government of india in terms of 
developing the curriculum that is called the national initiatives of allied health science nihas we were our team the faculty members of our institutions played an important role along with uh, with the uh, or led by the dr kavita narayan and the most importantly the national commission for allied and healthcare profession bill 2021 is recently pla- uh, approved both in the parliament and then the rajya sabha she played a very significant role in establishing in this council for the indian allied health and healthcare professional on behalf of the entire community of allied and healthcare professional team madam i uh, compliment as well as thank you for your excellent work in strengthening our professionals in the country on behalf of the manipal college of health profession and the indian association of respiratory care i extend a very cordial welcome to you to this e, e- series of webinar on the fundamentals of respiratory care during covid 19 with this few introductory remarks once again i congratulate and compliment both the indian association of respiratory care indian academy of respiratory care and the the department of respiratory therapy of manipal college of health profession for jointly organizing this event thanks for the opportunity i wish the all the best to all the delegates and once again thanks to all the resource person for your uh, support to conduct this workshop webinar thank you all thanks for the opportunity thank you sir uh, now i request our guest of honor ms kavita narayan advisor human resources for health systems at ministry of health and family welfare government of india to deliver the inaugural address thank you thank you so much for those very very kind words um, words of introduction um, my hearty congratulations to um, this rather young group of of uh, and, and a young professional group as well of respiratory uh, care therapists and uh, thank you so much dr arun for uh, for your very kind words for manipal being such a leader in the space and also for hosting us more than now 9 years ago when we actually started on this journey of uh, you know really pushing the allied and healthcare professionals to the forefront and i think many of you may be aware or some of you may not be but we've had a very very long journey in trying to really get to where we are today and getting recognition for over 56 groups of professionals that uh, hopefully we've managed in the last last literally in the last month is when this act has been passed or rather two months ago um, i wanted to take a quick minute to just um, you know really talk about you know i just finished a call we we are in a in a very major committee as you as you are aware right now we are in the middle of covid you know we just finished wave 2 of covid we we are very much preparing for wave 3 of covid <clears throat> and um, some of you may be aware so we are on this committee with which is actually planning capacity building for the entire country so i actually am the secretary there for that committee we have about 15 of india's top doctors you know most of the the policy professionals uh, secretaries etc from various departments and we are trying to roll out and build the capacities of close to 80 lakh or 8 million of the health workforce of india uh, in order to really be prepared for the next wave which may be we are thinking it could be in two months it could be in three months but there is obviously a very very big big task ahead of us very interestingly we started my my you know the last conference call which was about 3 hours ago 3 hours long rather started with respiratory therapy they had no idea that i was going to come here and speak but interestingly dr anjan trika professor anjan trika actually heads intensive medicine at the all india institute of medical sciences and you know each of these doctors i had given them work and said we need to know what to teach you know to whom we are doing something called a role mapping exercise so that we can actually task shift people down so that what we can do is uh, is say okay what are the work what is the work of the doctor that the doctor needs to be most efficient for what is the work that maybe a physiotherapist can undertake what is the work that a respiratory care therapist can undertake etc i'm telling you all this because as an inaugural address i don't want to be making any formal comments i really want to know want everybody on this platform to know the important and critical work that each of you play and the fact that it is important for organizations and associations such as yours to get the word out into the entire not just in the you know health systems here in the south but it was important and interesting because dr trika asked me he says do we have respiratory therapists in india he says kavita you've been in the us and maybe that's where you're looking at this from so i had to tell him no sir i can assure you that there is a very large vibrant community community of respiratory therapy in india not just in the united states where i was and which is where obviously i came back and you know i was shocked about sort of not having a large allied group over here which is why the work started 
So then he told me, he said, what do they study? Do they have a curriculum? Do they have, you know, a standardized courses? Who knows what they're doing? So we had a 30 minute discussion at the level of all the committee secretaries, the secretaries of various departments today and some of the highest you know, level professors in the country today on respiratory therapy, not because of anything else, but because people were even shocked in some parts of the country to know that there are respiratory therapists in India. This means that there is work to be done also, right? It means that the word has to get out. It means that it should not just be in a Manipal or in a you know, Christian Medical College well or we have to have respiratory therapy at AIMS. We have to have respiratory therapy post created in government colleges. We have to ensure that respiratory therapy and several other allied groups are out so that particularly for ICU management, you know, where we are struggling and I, I, I lead the HRH effort for the entire country. And here we are, you know, deploying, trying so hard to deploy, deploy our resources, trying hard to make our doctors efficient. You are such a massive group in order to help us do that. And particularly in the times of COVID, you'll have played such a major role. It is critical now for this to get into the mainstream a lot more. And mainstreaming happens in India in the policy circles only when it goes into the government institutions as well. So it is important. In fact, one of the very first things I'm going to do after I get back is going to ask you all to share the contents of this very, very interesting, uh, you know, e-conference that's happening over the next couple of days, because I would like to take it and share it with everybody in Delhi and everybody in the rest of the country and say, here is the, you know, some of the modules that these people are looking at. Here is their curriculum. Here is what they're actually studying. So it's my job, obviously, to do that. But I think there is obviously also a role of this group of you all to continue to do the good work that you are doing to uh, increase the level of professionalism and increase the level of outreach to tell people that there is a very important role. It is such a critical group. Obviously, I don't need to be told that because I'm aware Dr. Arun doesn't need to be told that, but it is important to get this word out in the larger community as well. And that really happens by us professionalizing this profession further, by getting you know, more standardized, by getting in place protocols, by ensuring that we are following you know, um, checklists. We spoke about all the right things and we are speaking about it in all the large meetings, but, but we need more people to sort of come forth and also be, and we need a large group of you. I think the two or 3,000 or the small numbers that we have now are going to have to really multiply in large numbers. And we are going to have to see respiratory care in every single you know, tertiary, secondary and tertiary facility in India. And so that's the that's a large sort of roadmap ahead of, you know, as, as I see um, for India. So there's a lot of exciting work here that needs to happen. Um, I, I really wanted to sort of just take maybe two minutes to also uh, talk to you all about the journey, you know, and, and sort of how this has evolved for us over the last so many years. So in 2011, 2012, when I returned from the United States, I used to actually run a large system in the United States called the Emory, Emory Healthcare, which is fairly well known. And I'm sure there are several of my colleagues from the US here on this call as well. Um, so, you know, over there, I was I, I trained to, to be a health policy and a health administrator in the US. And I, I studied and I ran hospitals, build hospitals, came back to India in 2011. And I was thoroughly shocked by the absolute absence of sort of, you know, uh, this, this carder as well as many other carders and, and particularly in secondary and tertiary care. The journey from there, particularly through the, the, the group of groups such as the Indian uh, Academy of Respiratory Care has been a very good one. I think I even came to one of your inaugurals maybe three or four years ago in Bangalore when um, Dr. Peter was, I think, probably the, the chairman at that point. And since then, I have been very, very impressed. I have to thank your secretary, Jitin, who keeps me posted at all points. And I know that your group is also very well abreast of all of the policy changes that are going. So I think you'll have done an excellent job in keeping yourselves abreast of what's going on, both in the policy field and hopefully what's going on in the clinical field as well. I think what will be very, very useful for us as a, as a government and as we are rolling out, you know, as we are doing COVID care planning, but also larger health system planning, is to know from you all what are all the various ways in which you can be an aid in the health system. So I think one of the things that you can probably talk about even in the next couple of days of a conference is actually to make a list, you know, almost a checklist of saying, here are the things that we are trained to do in the ICU. Here are the things that we are trained to do, you know, in terms of cardiac care. Here are the things that we are trained to do in terms of, you know, neurology, just whatever that may be. But I think the skill sets and what competencies you are actually building as a respiratory care therapist needs to now be outlined in the larger, larger sphere and in the larger context. And I would be very, very happy to be your agent to sort of communicate that to the larger, uh, you know, to the larger, larger world out there, if you will, within India, so that people are aware. Because I know that every doctor would be thrilled to have a respiratory therapist in there in his or her ICU or in his, in his, in his theater to sort of help, but they are not even aware. 
So I would put this onus on you all. In fact, a challenge over the next couple of days for you all to really brainstorm that and also come out with how do you get that word out? And what are some of the modules that you already have that we can actually take on and maybe even integrate as part of our larger capacity building initiative? We are now, like I told you, I have a very small task. We have to only get 8 million people ready and trained in the next two months you know, for, for COVID. I mean, it's just a piece of cake, no problem at all. So we are basically losing sleep. You know, We have no idea what's going on right now and how we're gonna do this, but we are looking for all resources and the most professional resources that we have, that's what's really gonna help us in, in moving this, this sort of, you know, this, this fight forward. So I would really urge you again to be very systematic in saying, here are some of the things that we can help in and here are the roles we can play clinically that we are trained to do and that we feel very confident to do. And I would work very closely with your friends from the, you know, the, the intensivists, the pulmonologists, your anesthesia friends, so that that can, because it's really a team, as you well know, between, between the two, right? I mean, you cannot, this, this team, team uh, playership and the multidisciplinary care aspect is one that we really, really are pushing for now, finally in India after all these years. And I feel like I'm ready to, you know, sort of uh, retire if required, because it's such a major paradigm shift in what we've seen versus a, a dialogue which only had doctors and maybe nurses and nobody else. And until that dialogue changes into one that brings on board every other different discipline and professionalizes them to be doing their work to the best of their ability, we knew that we wouldn't be able to change the health system. We really did not want COVID to be here to have, to, to have us teach us that, but that's what COVID has done in some ways. And we are very, very glad that for that part, not for the other parts of COVID, but COVID has really enabled us to push on some of these larger health system reforms sort of faster. And one of the most important ones we are doing is task shifting. So task shifting effectively, task shifting competently, task shifting safely, putting the patient to the center of care. This is a very new dialogue, not the doctor, not the nurse, not the hospital, but putting the patient at the center of the safety matrix so that everybody else is working around them as a multidisciplinary team and every single professional is doing his or her job to the best of their ability, not being worried about, you know, the hierarchy, not being worried about other things. And that's really the vision for, at least for me, for the health system. If we have a system where we can develop professionals such as you all, but a lot more of you all, like I said, I think we would have, we would have really, I mean, it may be a few years before we see that, but that's okay. We've at least sown the seeds and we have done, you know, I think we've done the right things. Now we've got to water it very, very consistently. I cannot, uh, I would be really remiss if I, if I did not mention the fantastic work that an institution like Manipal does and have been continuing to do that over the last decade or so in really recognizing the potential of, of these professions and having an exclusive college and a school of allied health sciences. I think now you call them health professions. Um, and I think that's, that's commendable um, but to you and your work, Dr. Uh, Dr. Arun, and to your, all of your, your predecessors, because I worked with many of them. Uh, and there are very few, unfortunately, colleges that we have. But like I said, again, I would like to see a respiratory program at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. I would like to see it at the PGI, you know, uh, JIPMER and every other institute so that this then becomes mainstream. I also have to say that for many of the state governments I have worked with and where all of you have provided care during COVID, they have been extremely complimentary. So for the few of you who were able to go, I think we've taken lists from you all and, you know, sent some of the names to many state governments. The state governments have been so thrilled. They were like, oh, who are these people? These are, they're so good. They're so well trained. So it's sort of new for them to see this, but I would wish that every state government is able to add you all to their, to their roles. So, you know, we have, we have this, um, we have a, a large number. And COVID really is going to, you know, it sort of made the earth more flat than we've ever known. So um, I attended the World Health Assembly virtually, you know, a couple of weeks ago uh, uh, at WHO. And the last report that we wrote on said that, uh, you know, the world will be short of about 8 million by 2030. That number has already gone to 30 million now. We've just, you know, thanks to COVID, a huge shortfall has been predicted. So the kind of numbers that we are looking at as a world is, um, you know, is, is not, not even funny. It's actually a really, really um, large number that we're looking at. Are you all able to hear me? Yes? Yeah, yes, ma'am. Are you able to hear me? Yes, ma'am. Can that somebody just it. give me feedback? Because it tells me my internet is unstable. So I wasn't sure if I was just speaking into thin yes, area. Yes. So do, do yes, tell me. Yes, okay, thank you. Yeah, so um, yeah, thanks. 
So one of the things that I think there is potential for, even in respiratory therapy, is to look at is there are there more specializations? You know, will you go down and you know then start looking at can we look at master's programs? Can we look at PhDs? Can we look at you know doctoral programs? Because I think every profession should go to the highest level of its um, you know of, of its of its competence. So is there a way for you to then specialize? Are we looking at you know sleep labs? Are we looking at sleep centers? Are we looking at you know there is there is a whole host of things that that are there that need to be done that we haven't explored really in India today yet. So the so it really is a, is a large uh, expands, if you will. COVID today has taught us that, you know, there is COVID long haul that all of us have heard of, right? Suddenly, there are all these cardiac issues that have come up, which are, in, we don't have enough cardiologists in this country for the cardiologists to be involved in doing an ECG or in doing, you know, there are there are neurological issues. We need to be doing sleep studying people. People are having insomnia. I mean, the problems of just the COVID patients are long and endless. And I can promise you, we do not have the number of health professionals at this point that are well trained to be able to look through even those issues. So it's not just treating for COVID because that's just emergency management. You know, patients coming in, we're we're maybe putting them on a ventilator if required. We're managing them, and you know, and then we we discharge them. But then what? Who's following up on them? What are the kind of follow up that's happening? What kind of studies are we doing to see? You know, have we actually retained the quality of life of these individuals? Because if we haven't, then we have also impacted the economy. 10 years from now, 20 years from now, we may have just a bunch of sick people that are, and that's just not for India. That's obviously an issue all over the world. But I think we have an opportunity here in order to ensure that there is a whole amount of wellness and, and longevity of life that we can do through, through the, you know, the skills of professions such as yourselves. So, so do aim to think big when you look over the next couple of days. So as you're learning, look at sort of what are the possibilities and what are the various ways in which you can be those those hands and feet and the brain if you will to these uh, these intensives you know to the to the neurosurgeons to the cardiologists to the various large groups that you you know actually can potentially help um, sort of bolster and and help up so i will really just end my comments with saying that uh, this is an exemplary effort for during covid despite everything you know for you all to continue doing learning and, and lifelong learning. I mean, that's what I was trained as a fellow of the American College is that you don't you don't stop learning till the moment you breathe. As long as you're alive, you keep learning because the day you stop learning is the day you're officially dead as far as I'm concerned. I mean, you may keep breathing, but there's not really much value you're contributing to. So keep learning. It's very important, right? We all keep learning. We learn every day and, and keep sharing and let's all together make sure that you know we come together to sort of deal with one of the most unprecedented um, and, and completely bizarre times that we are going through in the world, but uh, there's nothing that we cannot do if we all put our minds together. Um, so with that, congratulations again to the organizers, to the IARC, to Manipal University, to all of our colleagues who have joined us from various different parts of the world. I'm presuming you are either awake very early or staying up late. So thank you for doing that. And um, many congratulations to all of you on behalf of the government of India as well. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for your very encouraging words of support and encouragement. So I now request uh, Mr. Jitin K. Sridharan, General Secretary of Indian Academy of Indian Association of Respiratory Care and the Governor for India, uh, Indian Council for Respiratory, International Council for Respiratory Care to deliver the opening remarks. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Binoy. I didn't hear the last word. It is for me, right? Can I? Okay, fine. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, dear Dr. Arun Maya, uh, Dean of uh, the Manipal College of Allied Health uh, Professions, Chief Patron. Uh, on behalf of IARC, thank you so much for consenting to collaborate and uh, doing everything possible to organize this meaningful scientific symposium. And it was a quick arrangement and uh, we managed to succeed. Uh, Ms. Kavita, Madam, uh, from Ministry of Health, I welcome you and thank you for joining us today from a very busy schedule. Uh, we are indebted to you for all what you're doing at the Ministry for Regularizing the Allied Health Profession and uh, bringing uh, recognition for respiratory therapy profession in the country. We welcome you, Madam, for this event. Uh, thank you so much for instilling so much hope in us, uh, for following uh, our, our generation to follow, and uh, you actually, you are lightning fire for them. The same thing happened in 2018 when we met in Bangalore. Uh, we took your words uh, with uh, utmost uh, respect and uh, priority. One of the advices that you uh, made to us is to prepare a curriculum, a standardized curriculum. And today I, I uh, uh, say to you that yes, we are ready with a 
full-fledged, unified, unique curriculum, and we are ready to submit it to the Government of India, which is formulated with a, a consortium of almost every universities who run the program in our country. And uh, uh, we identified, as of course, as you mentioned, that we identified 15 subspecialties in uh, respiratory therapy, and uh, we have a unified job description, uh, which is reviewed by the national and international panels. We launched uh, fellowship programs uh, uh, for spreading the word. We are doing uh, continuous uh, uh, scientific activities. And it is with immense pleasure today, I say that this is the 33rd scientific program, 33rd scientific program jointly organized by Indian Academy and IARC uh, uh, of, uh, that accounts average of two to three programs per month since coronavirus appeared in our country 14 months before. Moreover, with the ex exemplary leadership of uh, our, uh, our mentor, Dr. Anita Shinoi, Madam, with the outstanding support of the uh, editorial board members, we launched a special COVID-19 issue of our journal, which uh, I, I don't think even uh, across the globe, if you take, there is no such uh, spe special issue has been launched uh, with a focus to the COVID. Uh, during this uh, difficult time, we signed seven MOUs with uh, different universities for actively involving the development of unifying respiratory therapy program and uh, for further uh, to that, uh, there, are, there are many under development and they are in line. Thanks to the leadership team of the academy, Ms. Dr. Manjush, Ms. Tisha, uh, Ms. Madhura, uh, Mr. Viron. Uh, Ms. Mrithula, Mr. Kishore, Gokul, and a lot more people, uh, which I, I don't, I, I have a lot uh, uh, in my list for their tremendous effort and support that you have given for ARC and for our profession. Uh, most of us are working abroad. Uh, still, we are able to contribute uh, uh, to the, the best of our abilities for the, the development of this program in the country. And our juniors are following us and uh, we are giving constant guidance for them. We have a full online platform for guiding them. We have courses to uh, run. A lot of things are happening. So uh, our future is exciting. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Daniel Rowley here from the United States. He is the Honorable President of the International Council for Respiratory Care. Uh, welcome to India, sir. And take this message from me on behalf of the authorities and uh, respiratory therapist in the country. Uh, we are immensely thankful for the unconditional support you provided during this difficult time. I would like to inform everyone that this, uh, with his sole efforts, hundreds of well-versed uh, RT groups, I have a specific uh, list of people, maybe more than 1,000 people uh, lined up behind IARC under the banner of ICRC to join us in the fight against COVID-19 uh, when the second wave happened. I would like to call him as the most sensational president ever in the history of ICRC, who really showed the, the, uh, the, the potential of this particular council to the entire uh, countries. We have 40 countries partnering in this particular council, and our message is going up everywhere. And uh, the, the country, uh, our country, uh, in terms of uh, respiratory therapy and respiratory care and our fight against COVID-19, and uh, the role that you all are doing uh, in, the, in the intensive care units and saving the patients, home care, setting up ICUs. Uh, we, some RTs, uh, we set up a dedicated ICU uh, in rural area, two dedicated ICUs in rural areas for, uh, for helping. Uh, this, is, this is amazing. This is just outstanding support that uh, uh, everyone uh, has given. The doctor's community is just behind us to support us uh, they actually need us. Uh, badly, they, they are in need of us. So as a result of that, we uh, the, the first society that identified uh, us and our contribution is the, the Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine. We signed our first MOU in March 1st. March 3rd, I arrived in, uh, uh, in, in Saudi Arabia back, to, back after signing the MOU and uh, we went on shutdown. After that, I could not travel back. Still, I'm stuck here. However, we are reaching somewhere, uh, all the distinguished panel, uh, faculty panel from across the globe, who most respected frontline healthcare providers, the faculty panel who join us here, most of our presentations are referring to your studies, your uh, guidelines, your presentations. It is really a scientific fiesta for the young generation of artists in the country. 
the key aim of this educational series, series is to enhance the skillful knowledge of all healthcare pro professionals to effectively manage acutely ill patients and i hope uh, there are a diverse group of uh, healthcare professionals are attending this program we had nearly uh, uh, 700 registrations today and i hope to continue the same for tomorrow as well uh, we come consider this as a commitment uh, to our motherland uh, to support its healthcare providers when they are in need our small initiative is well taken by the prominent university and authorities of the country uh, the next uh, uh, program in line is uh, in collaboration with old institute of medical sciences on the first week of july and in the middle itself uh, every weekend or uh, uh, weekdays we have uh, isolated uh, uh, dedicated programs as well going on our youtube channel if you look at that it is filled with a bunch of videos and huge number of views in multiple languages we in collaboration with old institute of medical sciences created five uh, awareness videos for the public for uh, general COVID care awareness and uh, day before yesterday we launched it. It is continued to be released in the next five days as a sequence. So one of the biggest lessons to conclude with this, one of the biggest lessons we have learned from this COVID, COVID is that uh, we as a very, very small scientific community working together can do some pretty amazing things. We befriended with the technology on a, on a lighter note, this pandemic surely has brought us uh, uh, out our interest. You know, we have seen uh, chefs, artists, uh, dancers, and writers who are actually doctors, artists, and corporates by profession. Looks like we have found what we really like to do. And uh, at the end of the day, all that matters is that what you, what you like to do and uh, your happiness while doing what you like. And I like to do uh, what I'm doing now. And I, I wish all, all of you should uh, uh, contribute uh, towards the growth of the profession in our country. Be proud of what you're doing. Join hands together for the good sake of a profession. Contribute your part. Grow together and accomplish all our tasks. Thank you for taking part in this wonderful event. Uh, thanks to um, Kavita Madam. Thanks to Rauli. Thanks to uh, Manipal College of Health Sciences and uh, Dr. Arun and the entire faculty and colleagues of respiratory therapy program at Manipal University uh, for this wonderful event. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this great opportunity. Thank you, sir. I now request Mr. Varun R. Naik, board member FARCACC and assistant professor, Department of Respiratory Therapy, MCHP, Manipal Academy of Higher Education to propose the word of thanks. Thank you, Binaj. Am I audible? Yes, Varun. Yeah, uh, a very good evening uh, to you all. Uh, it is my privilege to have been asked to propose a vote of thanks on this fine occasion. On behalf of Manipal College of Health Professions and Indian Association of Respiratory Care, I extend my sincere thanks to the distinguished guest of honor, Ms. Kavita Naren, advisor at Tarej for Health Systems at Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India for taking time out of busy schedule to create this occasion. Thank you, madam. I also extend my sincere thanks to Dr. G. Arun Maya, Dean, Manipal College of Health Professions, Manipal Academy of Higher Education for all the guidance and support you have provided for the success of this workshop. Thank you, sir. I would like to extend my sincere thanks to the President of Indian Association of Respiratory Care, Dr. Jerry Paul, for all the guidance and support. I would like to extend my sincere thanks to Mr. Jitin, Jitin K. Sridharan, General Secretary, uh, Indian Association of Respiratory Care and Governor for India. ICRC, and also Dr. Manjush Kartika, Chairperson, Indian Academy uh, of Higher, uh, Indian Academy of uh, Respiratory Care, and all the office bearers of the Indian Association of Respiratory Care and the Indian Association of uh, Indian Academy of Respiratory Care for their effort behind the smooth conduct of this workshop. I also extend my sincere thanks to the head of the Department uh, of Respiratory Therapy, Ms. Pratibha Todu, for her guidance and support, and also to Mr. Binoy K. Kuryakos who has worked hard for the success of this program. I thank all the speakers uh, who have happily accepted the task and finding time to sharing their valuable knowledge with us during, the, during this workshop. Last but not least, I thank all the participants who have joined for this two-day ECOS jointly organized by Department of Respiratory Therapy, Manipal College of Health Profession, and the Indian Association of Respiratory Care. Thank you all, and have a happy learning session. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Varun.
Uh, thank you, distinguished guests and panelists. So we now continue with the academic session. So uh, next up, we have an interesting panel discussion. So this session will be moderated by two of the very renowned respiratory therapists, uh, Mr. Daniel T. Rowley, uh, respiratory therapy adult cl clinical coordinator, University of Virginia Medical Center, US. Daniel Rowley, uh, MSC RRT, ACCS, uh, RRT, NPS, and uh, RPFT, FARC, is president of the International Council for Respiratory Care and has been practicing respiratory care for 28 years. He is a past chair of the Virginia Licensure Board for Respiratory Care and holds, currently holds advisory and committee positions on national and international committees related to respiratory care. Daniel has published research manuscripts in medical journals and presence at conferences around the world. We welcome you, sir. The next panelist is uh, Mr. Sri Harsha Tatineni. So Harsha is the senior respiratory therapist at Al Raba Hospital under Sheikh Khalifa Medical City, Seha, Abu Dhabi, UAE. He, as in charge of the department, oversees the management of mechanically ventilated patients and the clinical practices of the respiratory care department. He is also vice chair of Seha Respiratory Therapy Consensus Committee, which is a governing committee of all the respiratory therapy departments across all public hospitals in Abu Dhabi, UAE. He entered the field of respiratory therapy in 2004 at Manipal, completing BSc in respiratory therapy from Manipal College of Health Professions, along with an ASRT degree from California College of, for Health Sciences, Salt Lake City, Utah, USA. So in 2008, he went on to appear for his licensure, examination, CRT, and RRT from the National Board of Respiratory Care in 2010. He has been serving IART since 2011, November, when he was working as a faculty of MCHP Manipal and had taken a lead role in re-registering association, which was registered initially as ARCI and in Hyderabad and has taken the immense uh, workload to change it to Indian Association of Respiratory Care in Manipal in 2011-12, as we know it today. With legal bylaws and a complete structural organization since, he was actively involved in various organizational and academic activities of the association as an executive committee member, and he is very interested on working towards progress of respiratory therapy profession in India. He completed his PG diploma in hospital and healthcare management in 2012, and he is responsible for the managed mechanical ventilation, education of respiratory care, staff nurses, advanced practitioners, as well as the physicians at his facility. Harsha has been speaking at conferences and locally and internationally, and also uh, he always has special interest in teaching respiratory care. With this brief introduction, I hand over the podium to the moderators, Mr. Sri Harsha Tatineni and Mr. Daniel Rowley. Thank you for the very nice introduction. And I want to begin by thanking Manakal uh, College of Health Sciences and the Indian Association for Respiratory Care uh, for letting me be here amongst yourselves today. Uh, you have put together an amazing e-learning event uh, during a very difficult time. Um, as president of the International Council, I actually represent 32 countries from around the world that um, are committed to advancing safe, effective, and ethical practice of respiratory care. I have been involved with the International Council for Respiratory Care um, for many years, and the Indian Association for Respiratory Care has had a governor on the board uh, since its inception in 1990. Um, because of Dr. Bome and BJ Despande, who were past governors, they have kept us abreast of the uh, tremendous work that has been done over the years in India. Uh, with uh, Jeth and Sari now as our governor, uh, Jeth and I are in very close contact with each other. And I can assure you that under his leadership and the leadership of the Indian Association for Restory Care, I'm seeing tremendous uh, work being done uh, in terms of collaboration and mobilizing uh, effectively uh, the, uh, the, the vision of, of respiratory care in India uh, that's focused on patient care. So I, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here today. Um, in light with the, um, uh, the theme of this program on fundamentals of respiratory care in COVID-19, um, I'm very happy that we're um, having a session uh, with experts from around the world who will be able to uh, give their background experiences uh, with COVID. 
Um, so to begin with, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Hoi-Ching Ge, who's uh, from Hangzhou, China. Uh, Dr. Ge also serves on the Executive Committee of the International Council for Respiratory Care. Uh, she was appointed as uh, a uh, committee person for the World Health Organization's Respiratory Care Committee that met weekly to discuss patient care management of COVID patients. She is extensively published and well known throughout the world um, in her area of respiratory care, which includes uh, both critical care and patient rehabilitation related to pulmonary disease. Uh, Dr. Go was also one of the first responders um, through uh, China's um, emergency uh, response team uh, to um, to Wuhan. So, uh, Dr. G, this is Dan. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Dan. Uh, it's my pleasure and honor to join this meeting. I'm sorry, I'm on the way to the, uh, you know, airport. So it's busy now. <laughs> Just to finish the meeting and uh, uh, good to meet you all. And I hope I can, yeah, uh, it's uh, my pleasure to, to take part uh, in this uh, panel. Webinar. Thank you. Great. Well, we have a question to start off with because as one of the first responders um, worldwide to um, to Wuhan to take, take care of patients with COVID-19, uh, you were part of this emergency task force, this uh, this uh, this work group that was summoned to Wuhan. Um, and there are countries such as China where respiratory care hasn't been well known until recent years. How did respiratory therapists uh, become recognized and appointed to this emergency response team? Oh, uh, thank you. And uh, almost 100 of uh, respiratory therapists to uh, join the, uh, to take care of the patients during that time. I think the, uh, it's the March last year. So uh, yeah, but you know, so many p uh, patients there and uh, uh, the, the artists uh, usually to be the trainer uh, to uh, train the uh, doctors and nurses to, uh, to, to learn how to take care of the rest, uh, me mechanical ventilation for the patients and to do the uh, respiratory care for the patients. So that's what we do. And in our hospital, we have 10 artists to jo uh, join the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the healthcare team. Uh, to uh, take care of the patients in Wuhan, Wuhan uh, uh, I think it's two uh, in two hospitals and the other uh, four of us uh, in Jingmen uh, City uh, Hospital, and uh, uh, we are the part of the uh, the group of uh, in intensive care uh, group uh, to try our best. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, during that time, uh, I think we take uh, almost uh, uh, one to two months to control the situation. So uh, that's good for us. And uh, uh, in Zhejiang, we, we have almost uh, uh, 3,000, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the doctors and the nurses and the artists to go to the Wuhan to uh, assist them assist the uh, yeah to uh, to do the uh, the medical uh, the therapy for the patients yeah like many and then, countries like many countries around the world they've um, seen um, a burdening of um, of healthcare staff because of the numbers of mechanically ventilated patients during wave one um, how were you guys able to manage that when the world knew little about COVID at that time? You're bringing in respiratory therapists to a province where respiratory therapy maybe wasn't so well known as teams from all over China were responding to relieve some of that strain. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, before that, uh, you know, uh, uh, many hospitals, uh, uh, you know, the administrator and uh, uh, some uh, uh, healthcare practitioner they did, did not know the uh, respiratory therapy and uh, uh, how they uh, what they do and uh, how they work uh, in the in the uh, you know the the uh, in the 
uh, a hospital and how to take care of the patients. And after the pandemic, uh, they, most of them know that that's a professional team group to do the professional thing. So uh, that's, uh, uh, you know, they uh, got a very uh, deep uh, impression about that. Uh -huh. So we do the bronchoscopy to the patients, uh, do the airway management and uh, to set the uh, ventilator parameters and uh, to, to do the uh, uh, protective ventilation uh, strategy. And uh, yeah, we also, uh, you know, follow the patient's situation and uh, to make sure what the term is uh, good for them to win the uh, winning, yeah, to win the uh, win the ventilator. So I think uh, we do the, uh, uh, yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, uh, Harsha. Hi, Dan. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I had a privilege to go off and it's a privilege uh, to be moderating this session with the standards in the profession. And I'm very happy to introduce Mr. Felix. Uh, Felix has been fellow of various associations. He's an administrative director for the respiratory therapy department and pulmonary physiology center at New York Brooklyn Methodist Hospital. So uh, Felix is bringing years of experience and, and from respiratory therapy, and uh, he's been a research expertise, including on application of advanced ventilator modalities. I have read so many of his uh, concepts and uh, articles. Uh, he has been uh, the reviewer on, on various abstracts of SCM and CHESS, as well as uh, Journal of American Association of Respiratory Care. Um, he has been numerous extracts, so he has been edited and uh, reviewed them for the years since, I mean, to say since 2009 with ARC and uh, fifth chest at 2013 till date. And he has been awarded the Adult Acute Care Practitioner of the Year from American Association of Respiratory Care. It's been a privilege to have you here, sir, and to share your experience with us regarding COVID uh, from the first wave till today. And kindly share us your experience to all uh, on how you handle this. We heard a lot about NUAC being um, hit by this first wave very hard and how you uh, arrange the equipment, shortage of equipment being addressed and the staffing being, and, and can you briefly uh, tell us all about it so that we can, and, and how are we preparing now for the next waves? Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for uh... Um, your kind introduction and um, yeah, the first uh, the uh, well, as we all know, uh, in New York, it all really started in the beginning of last March, uh, beginning of March, and it pretty much started as a perfect storm. You know, uh, in the beginning of March, in our hospital, we had about 30 wanted patients. And about three weeks later, we had 130. So um, I think uh, one of the lessons that I can tell you that we all learned from the very beginning is uh, when those patients were coming in, we were not sure exactly how to treat them. So a lot of them got intubated in the beginning. And it's not just true for our hospital, just general metro New York metropolitan area for beginning of March when the COVID just arrived. Um, a lot of those patients got intubated because, you know, care. You know, a lot of the caregivers were getting sick, and people were uh, getting very nervous of how to take care of those patients. What is aerosolized procedure? What is not aerosolized procedure? A lot of those patients were not immediately placed on high flow in the very beginning. Then, when a lot of people realized that high flow works really well, uh, more of those patients were placed on high flow. But again. Uh, high flow was in short demand, uh, in short supply, I should say, in short supply at that time. And everybody started to kind of, kind of scramble for the high flow. One of the lessons that we did learn is uh, if you do not protect the caregivers, there will be no caregivers to take care of the patients. So the most important asset that any institution or any hospital has is the caregivers. If the caregivers are out of play, there is nobody to take care of patients. So um, 
uh, obviously the caregivers have to be protected. Uh, the, um, um, you know, obviously N95 and N95 masks and, and eye protection, et cetera, are essential. In the beginning of March, everything was in sh short supply. So everything was uh, very challenging for everybody involved. Uh, would we, I know in one of the pre presentations, I know that one of the presenters uh, showed Felix One, which was a scavenging device. But, you know, it, to tell you the truth, when I developed that device, that device was never initially meant to be a commercialized product. And in the developing world or anywhere else, uh, you don't really need Felix One. All you really need is a face stand. You need to have a suction tubing that gets connected to the, um, the existing hospital suction system. You literally flip suctioning to the max and you place it, uh, you place modified face stent around somebody's face and you will be able to remove over 90% of the particles, contaminated particles being removed uh, away from the patient's face and away from the caregivers. So uh, that very simple solution does not necessarily have to be a very fancy uh, product. I mean, of course, if you have 20 bucks and you want to buy a vapor term product, that's great, but uh, you don't have to. You can just take a face stand connected to suction tubing, connected to um, suction system, flip it to the max and, and protect a lot of your caregivers and, um, and be able to treat those patients in the early stages. One thing that I can tell you that I learned with COVID uh, in the early phases is if we allow those patients to lose their respiratory reserve, Everything else becomes a little too late, you know, too little and too late. So the key is to try to treat them as early as possible with high flow. And if it works, it works. And if it doesn't, you might need to consider other options. You need to be very cautious when utilizing BiPOP therapy. Um, I'm not saying that BiPOP therapy should not be utilized, but BiPOP therapy needs to be utilized with caution because if, if, if patient has a phenotype L, which is associated with um, a lot of uh, microembolism and typically comes with good lung compliance, patients on BiPAP may pull in huge tidal volumes, which may cause value trauma at the end of the day. And then you wind up intubating patient who is not only having a lot of issues associated with COVID and microembolism, but also uh, dealing with um, value trauma, which make things just much more complicated. So, um, and uh, the, the final thing that I really wanted to say is really, um, no matter what you do, whether you use high flow therapy or you use non-invasive ventilation or you use invasive ventilation, you should really always try to utilize heated humidification because patients with COVID have, uh, a lot of them have very, uh, very thick secretions. And if you're not actively humidifying, whatever you're doing, you will make things just progressively worse. So uh, whatever you do, you just really need to make sure you actively humidify. And um, in a nutshell, that's pretty much all I wanted to say. Uh, thank you, Felix. Uh, this is Dan. I, I have a follow-up question. Um, you mentioned uh, the importance of protecting the healthcare workers caring for these patients, and we recognize that asymptomatic SARS um, COVID-2 infection may have actually played a really important role in uh, nosocomial transmission to healthcare uh, workers. Um, where I work at the University of Virginia, um, there are patients who are coming out of the operating room who were screened as negative um, uh, with COVID uh, screening. By the time they get to the ICU a few days later, they start becoming symptomatic and then they come back positive. And our staff at that time did not have um, N95 or PAPR masks on and all of a sudden 10 of our staff are out. How have you guys dealt with that? Well, uh, I can tell you that we experienced very similar problems in, in l l last March. A uh, patient comes into the emergency room with CHF and everybody's taking care of patient with CHF. And then uh, the next day we find out that in addition to CHF, the patient has COVID, you know, and now you have all these people exposed to the COVID. So well, I think that the only practical way, and I know, look, back then last March N95 was you know, almost like a hard currency, almost 
as close to gold as you can get. Uh, because, you know, if you cannot protect yourself and cannot protect your family and you're dead, what does it matter if you have gold? It cannot help you to stay alive, right? So, yeah, and 95 was a very hot commodity back then. But I think that the lessons learned is, uh, particularly during pandemic, everybody should utilize universal precautions in a way where every patient should be treated uh, with healthcare giver, healthcare providers being, having an access to N95 and eye protection and uh, et cetera, because you just don't know who is who. And I really think that going forward, and I know that back then it was just, we were kind of like in the early stages, but I think that going forward, I, I hope that the manufacturers of manual resuscitators will come out with an integrated ambo bag that will have a uh, HEPA filter attached to it as a permanent attachment. Because you know what, when you come into the room, if you don't have uh, HEPA filters to be placed uh, at the exhalation of the um, manual resuscitator, you might potentially uh, spread, uh, make aerosolized procedure just uh, much more aggressive, if you will, and spread particles throughout the room in a much more aggressive way, uh, particularly in patients who do not have such wonderful lung compliance and you have to squeeze the back stronger and you have pro propellant of the particles throughout the room uh, in a much more aggressive way. So I think that going forward, I would, I would hope that the manual resuscitators will come with permanently attached HEPA filtration rather than just an ample bag. And then it becomes an administrative decision. Well, do we wanna spend an extra 50 cents or $2 or $3 on a filter or not? Uh, and yes, it becomes, it, it becomes, at the end of the day, it becomes uh, a question of whether you want to spend the money or not. I think that hopefully as we go forward, various physicians organizations and respiratory therapy organizations and, and nursing organizations hopefully will come with a position statement where uh, whatever we utilize for the care of the patients will protect the caregivers. Because as important as patients are, if we cannot protect the first line uh, providers that will go into those COVID rooms and will try to um, save those patients. If we cannot protect our, our own, then nothing else matters in my book. Great, Felix. And I think you've hit on two very important things that we've also learned uh, now that we're in uh, phase three or wave three of COVID. A, uh, proper PPE. When we're doing aerosol generating procedures, one of which you identified manual ventilation, all of our respiratory therapists are required to have an N95, a P100 or a proper device on. Two, all patients who receive manual ventilation, regardless if they are confirmed to have COVID or a PUI or not, we always put on a HEPA filter on the manual resuscitation bag. So uh, thank you for your comments. Um, I want to move forward with our next panelist, and we'll loop back around to the other panelists in a short bit, but uh, Mr. Eric Kreiner is a, a registered respiratory therapist um, mm -hmm. in Washington, D.C. at MedStars Washington Hospital Center. He's a clinical specialist who is an expert in mechanical ventilation, uh, presents at many conferences around the world, and is a good friend of mine. And um, he is in an urban setting, Washington, D.C., where they've cared for many, many uh, very sick uh, SARS-CoV-2 patients. Um, Eric, would you mind giving us your perspective? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Dan. Uh, and thank you to the IARC for uh, having me here. Um, I absolutely commend you for the, the learning opportunities that you're presenting for everybody, um, and they're outstanding. Um, I think, you know, the, the one thing that I, you know, as, as I've watched all the presentations and listened to the comments um, that, that I kind of wanted to, to put out there was the importance, um, and, and we've touched on it in a bunch of different ways here, uh, the importance of protocolized uh, medicine based on, you know, evidence-based practices, right? And uh, whether that is from the non-invasive to the invasive side of uh, how important those are. Um, I'll switch over to the invasive side here, you know, in terms of monitoring patients uh, by measuring plateau pressures and uh, utilizing low tidal volume ventilation. Um, those are key into uh, managing these patients to a successful outcome. 
But one of the other interesting things that was brought up um, in a couple different ways, um, the, the Madam Minister that, that spoke uh, and, and gave comments uh, referred to patient-centered care um, and how important that is that we do put the patient in, in the middle of our care circle. Uh, and and when it when you think about the modalities that we then apply to a patient, um, you you often, if you're going to put the patient at the center of it, you have to personalize the those therapeutic modalities to the patient. And so uh, Felix and throughout some of the presentations, you know, started to mention this, and, and we we talked about this with the large tidal volumes that, that could be had within non-invasive ventilation and the self-inflicted lung injury that, that could be had uh, or, or seen um, by patients that had vigorous inspiration with large tidal volumes on non-invasive ventilation. But as you switch over into invasive ventilation, the same thing, you know, certainly holds true. And, and I would also recommend, you know, uh, or the idea of monitoring these patients and, and preventing self-inflicted lung injury uh, and personalizing the mechanical ventilation strategy to that particular patient. It's important to understand uh, the, the the driving pressures that are being mon are being used within mechanical ventilation. The driving pressure being the plateau pressure minus the keep so that you understand the patient's lung compliance that you are actually taking care of in front of you at that particular moment. You can really personalize the, the volume and the PEEP settings that you're using in that situation for that particular patient. Because as much as protocolized medicine has helped us, has helped us to decrease mortality across ARDS mechanical ventilation, it is the personalization of this that is starting to evolve as well. So I think when you go to take care of, of these patients, start with the protocolized medicine and then evolve into more of a personalized approach. Um, I think what we've found in taking care of, you know, hundreds into the thousands of mechanically ventilated COVID patients is that not all of them are the same way. And so therefore protocolized medicine dictates you know, largely that we treat everybody the same. And I think you have to really be cognizant that they aren't all the same in every situation. Um, using the, those evidence-based principles, but then personalizing. And so I think that would, that would be the biggest thing that we learned and, and how important it is in terms of monitoring these patients uh, and, and then managing them to successful outcomes. Uh, excellent points. And I, I, I agree that individualizing um, how we care for patients has become even more paramount as we have more physiologic monitoring. Um, and I'd like to uh, explore um, with you your experience with transpulmonary pressure manometry. Um, I, I know you do a lot of that as we do. And uh, one of our um, moderators, um, Harsha, will uh, get his um, input as well. Um, but I think that we've been seeing a lot of pneumomediastinums um, among these COVID patients. And these are patients who may have patient self-inflicted lung injury during spontaneous breathing. And when you measure those inspiratory transpulmonary pressures, they can be pretty darn high. So yeah. um, maybe you can comment on that. And then one of our um, viewers is um, asking if, any inst uh, if you have any experience with ECMO trained RTs because uh, they understand that ECMO is helping us, but it's taken a long run. Sure, sure. Yeah, so I'll address the, the question from the, the, the group first. Um, I think one of the, the more popular models of, of ECMO management, at least in the United States, is an RTRN model. Um, there, there are certainly different ones where perfusion may manage uh, ECMO, um, but you know, as, as ECMO programs are expanding and becoming more prevalent, um, you know, it's an institution-based decision on, on what kind of model, and I think, you know, Quite honestly, the, the more cost-effective model is an RTRN uh, ECMO management model, and, and that's what you're seeing is, is a lot more RT into ECMO specialist uh, transition. Um, 
And so we manage ECMO uh, at our at our particular institution as, as such. And you know, we we we've done a lot of ECMO, uh, BV ECMO specifically over this last year. Um, you know, running many many cases at, at one time. Uh, and and we're learning a lot in that in that respect too on on uh, selection criteria and, and its impact on outcome. So yes, uh, RTS are starting to become more prevalent within the within the ECMO specialist world. Um, you know, in terms of transpulmonary pressure management, uh, we started out uh, you know in, in our transpulmonary pressure management. Uh, I, I guess program or or the the therapeutic or manage or monitoring uh, option, we we really kind of were looking at selection criteria in the beginning when we started doing this, you know, 12 years ago in patients that were morbidly obese or had BMIs that were really really high. Um, those were pretty straightforward that there was most likely going to be significant chest wall involvement. And so we used uh, transpulmonary pressure or esophageal pressure to monitor transpulmonary pressures, specifically in those patients. But as we started to evolve and, and really, really understand where and when and in whom you can use and should use transpulmonary pressure monitoring, what we started to really understand is our, our real underappreciation for the chest wall uh, involvement in terms of pressures. Um, and it isn't just in patients that may have a BMI that is greater than 32 or 34, wherever your, your cutoff may be. Um, it, is, it is in patients that have BMIs that are less than that. And so um, we have started to use esophageal manometry in more widespread patients. Um, and not only to guide PEEP and to guide our understanding of maximal um, uh, and inspiratory airway pressures, uh, you know, we have also started to use it as, as Dan referred to in, in terms of spontaneous breathing, you know, because I think the transpulmonary pressure, the, the inspiratory transpulmonary pressure uh, is key into the etiology of, of lung injury, right? And however you create that, whether it's in a passive patient in which you use a large volume or a large airway pressure, to generate that transpulmonary pressure, or whether you're being rather conservative with volume and conservative with airway pressure, but a patient is vigorously inspiring to create a dramatic decrease in their pleural pressure. Either way uh, that, that you get to that point, they both end up with a large transpulmonary pressure. And what is, what is not directly visible to you um, is that understanding of the transpulmonary pressure and the effect and consequence of patients that are vigorously inspiring during spontaneous ventilation. And, and I will note that that spontaneous ventilation is either invasive or non-invasive. I think we exacerbate that transpulmonary pressure when we put patients on non-invasive or BiPAP, as Felix uh, alluded to, we exacerbate that transpulmonary pressure gradient. Uh, and it's clear that we exacerbate it when we invasively ventilate somebody. Um, you know, and so you quickly get to the point of, even if you are managing patients with plateau pressures that are extremely modest, uh, I, I'll say in, end inspiratory alveolar pressures of 25, which you feel really good about. But then because the patient's uh, course of stay becomes elongated and neurologic management becomes difficult and patients start to wake up more, um, whether it's we're using less sedation or they become more tolerant, that the end result is that they have spontaneous ventilation. And in the face of that, that we find, we're seeing that that spontaneous ventilation is rather vigorous. Uh, they have a high inspiratory drive um, and that high inspiratory drive with vigorous inspiration and significant decrease in pleural pressure creates problems. Um, pneumomediastinum, pneumothorax, uh, where you typically wouldn't expect to see it in, in a in, in normal ventilator setting. Great. Um, Harsha, 
you're located in the UAE. Uh, would you mind um, chiming in at this point with your experiences on uh, this discussion? Yes, then, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, in UAE, yes, uh, we are fortunate uh, from the first wave to now, we are currently going through a third surge. Um, yes, I, I just want to highlight a couple of points in how we managed the first wave when, uh, with the PPE shortage and the staff are not ready to go in as frontline, even though everything is provided to them because that it took a while. I hope the same happened across the globe that um, everyone is scared to go in. So at that point of time, when we had a full blown, like I'm talking about a 30 plus bedded ICU there, and um, we had an extreme shortage of RTs where we have to go for like every shift to four to five pronings and intubations and management of ventilator. So that was overwhelming for the RT on a shift. So it, it took us quickly to understand how can we distribute this work. Uh, there are a lot of professionals who can handle this work. It's just make them understand that it's a team work. So we brought in this concept called uh, the team approach for different activities. The airway is managed by anesthesia technologists uh, with an anesthetist for intubation till they secure the airway and put on vent. That's when they call in the RT to manage the vent. And we have developed a proning team uh, consists of an RN to, and a PN and a um, PT. Uh, anesthesia on the airway if RT is busy and a physician. Uh, so this is the team that goes in and if RT is available, he will be the part of the team. Then we have developed a rehab team um, who can like PTs, occupational therapists and speech uh, who take care of patients after extubation in an aggressive rehab and all these COVID patients are requiring very extensive rehabs. I, I hope all of you agree on that. So this team approach really helped us in handling the first wave. And um, I, I believe that that continued to help us during the second and third. And we are still sticking to that approach and uh, bringing in this, that is one point. Second, uh, we have moved from a normal hospitals to uh, dedicated negative pressure room hospitals, all like, uh, in the UAE, uh, especially there are two facilities right now that are modified into, every room has been modified into a negative pressure room. We are fortunate to have the leadership to support us in that. And the shortage of PPEs have been addressed and enough papers uh, are available for the staff right now who was going in for aerosol generating procedures. So. Um, those are the changes. As per the RT's approach, uh, we were uh, aggressive in using uh, plateau pressures, as Eric has mentioned, and uh, driving pressures. Despite being so aggressive in that and monitoring these every shift, we saw spontaneous pneumothorax access being developed during, due to the increased inspiratory drive. Initially, the blame and it was put on that you're not being monitored properly, but then they realized it's not it's not what we are doing. It's, it's COVID as such causing this because we saw this happening on high floor and IV patient itself. That's, that's, that's when we realized, come stop, stop this and say, uh, be extra cautious. So that's why I want to hear on this transpulmonary pressures. We started using um, the catheter C6 ventilators and introducing these catheters and we could wean off the patient. Again, the challenge came to us while weaning these patients, we could spont uh, we could wean them off uh, when they are on a muscle relaxant. Then the challenge is to not use muscle relaxant so much. Start making them breathe spontaneously, and that's when they decompensate. Uh, so I want to ask the panelists today about this ABCDF approach from SCCM. How can we uh, incorporate this in COVID weaning? Um, so that, that is my question to Eric and Felix. Um, I actually just, um, uh, I used to have senior moments. Now I have senior minutes and I don't want to forget what I wanted to say. So I just wanted to kind of rewind for one moment, uh, of what Eric mentioned and I appreciate it very much. And then also something that you mentioned, um, as far as transpulmonary pressures are concerned in COVID patients. So I think that the, I think at least my personal feeling is what we're dealing with with the COVID lung versus typical ARDS lung is a little different. 
uh, in a sense where it appears to be that the COVID lung is somewhat more fragile, if you will, than a typical ARDS lung because uh, I use my uh, G5s for, uh, to measure transpulmonary pressures. And when we try to measure transpulmonary pressures in some of our COVID patients, uh, I had some patients that were absolutely optimized with transpulmonary pressure of zero, which is bingo. And they still develop pneumomediastinum and they still develop pneumothorax. Because don't forget, the transpulmonary pressures is just a global, global number. You know, it's not for every region of the lung. You might have uh, zero at what that average is where the catheter can measure, but it could be plus 20 in some other region of the lung. You know, it's pretty much the same thing with plateau pressures. Everybody's looking at the plateau pressures. I don't believe there was ever a study that measured plateau pressures in, let's say, supine versus prone, because I'm sure it would be a little different what you're really measuring. And again, it's a global number. We might have plateau pressure under 30, but we can still wind up with pneumomediastinum or more pneumothorax. And <clears throat> particularly what I do want to say is I want to mention about something that Eric said, and I appreciate it very much. There has to be absolutely a customized way of how we deal with those patients. Yes, most of the patients will want to treat the same way in a protocolized way. And no, no, nobody wants to go to the war and start from a nuclear weapon. Everybody want to start with a handgun. And if a handgun works, it's a beautiful moment, right? So we want to go and we treat those patients with lung protective strategy. And we want to control them if we need to sedate or paralyze them. We want to, we want to do what, what's considered to be a standard of care. But if your back is to the wall and things are not working as planned, you should be able to adapt to the situation. For instance, I know that everybody's talking about uh, non-invasive ventilation, everybody's talking about high flow, everybody's talking about invasive ventilation, but there are other things out there. Again, I'm not saying that those things are considered to be standard of care, if you will, but they are out there. And in some patients where it's applicable, and this is where I agree with Eric so much where selection of the patients is paramount, right? Uh, there are some patients who will benefit not necessarily from positive pressure ventilation, but from negative pressure ventilation. And you are in UK, my friend, uh, um, Mr. Um, she, I, I am terribly sorry if I'm in yeah, from UAE, right? Okay, so, you're from UAE. Okay. so I know you probably have an access to negative pressure ventilation better than a lot of other people out there, right? Uh, because you have the, uh, th this is where I, I believe that I don't want to call names of devices, but this is just, a it, it's like one of a kind, kind of like the Hayek uh, caress, right? Coming out from England. So we utilized uh, negative pressure ventilation in some selected cases where patient was getting tired on high flow therapy and at the same time had a lot of secretions. So you know that if you put, and, and let's say patient has uh, several, uh, um, you know, uh, underlying conditions such as obesity or hypertension, et cetera. So you know, when they're gonna get intubated, it's not gonna be a pretty picture, right? So some of those patients, if appropriate, were placed on uh, negative pressure ventilation in conjunction with the sky flow. You know, so not everybody necessarily have to be on positive pressure, even though that that's of course a much more standardized option, if you will. Now on the other side, you intubate someone and you drop is of a geo balloon and your transpulmonary pressure is zero and your peep is let's say, I don't know, 22. And everything looks great in terms of mechanical ventilation but your patient O2 sat is 76 on 100% in people of 22 and they're already prone. What is the next stop? The next stop is pretty much heaven, right? If you don't address something in timely fashion, right? So we had some of our patients, and again, ECMO is, is, is a much more standardized way to do it. Now, again, the hospital may be able to offer ECMO, maybe not. Now, not everybody on ECMO will do great. Uh, as I'm sure Eric is in an ECMA center, just like I am in an ECMA center. And we both know that sometimes, unfortunately, COVID does terrible damage to the lungs. So you can put somebody on ECMA and then five months later, oh my God, where are we gonna get that organ, right? We, we had some of those situations where we had people on for very, very long time on ECMA. So um, 
you know, some of those, I mean, you know, I utilize one of the options that maybe is not nearly as widespread is high frequency percussive ventilation, again, or administered by VDR. It will work in some cases and it will not work with other because with COVID two by two sometimes is fine, right? But if we have different options, like Eric said, customized patient care, I, I think it's very helpful. It's like you come to the bedside with the toolbox and more tools you have in your toolbox, better are the chances that you may be able to adopt something that will work for that patient. But yes, I agree, protocolized care should be the, and the standardized care should be the first wave of what you really do for the patient. Great, and we've also seen, uh, we've been talking a lot about the uh, escalation of care uh, surrounding mechanical ventilation, but of course, let's say you're taking care of somebody like I am in the emergency room, I have a PUI coming in, um, who's complaining of shortness of breath, they're hypoxic. One of the first things I like to do once I give supplemental oxygen is really advocate for early self-proning. Okay. And then secondly, there's now work of breathing scales that have been published in the literature to help um, clinicians objectively assess their patients to determine whether or not this patient's heading towards intubation or not by simple things like uh, counting respiratory rate, looking for nasal flaring, inspiratory and accessory um, expiratory accessory muscle flexion. Those types of things should be introduced into healthcare facilities to really try to standardize the assessment of the bedside clinician so that we can't, so we don't move too quickly, but also less slowly. Uh, we do have a couple of questions coming in uh, from some of our uh, uh, attendees, um, one of which um, goes back to um, Harsha, I believe. Um, not only are we providing inpatient care, but there's a time where our patients, as you said, require you know respiratory therapists and multidisciplinary care involvement with rehabilitation, right, because of the neuromyopathies. But the question about this is, um, what about the mental health and well-being of these COVID patients and healthcare professionals? What are we doing? Yes, um, that was a that was a good question to be, and the burnout that has been seen in the healthcare professionals. Um, uh, what we have seen in UAE is a lot of them shifting the roles, uh, changing the. Uh, the institution where they are working, going to a lighter facilities like in UAE now we distributed uh, the hospitals as the primary center which takes care of acute patients. Then once they are extubated, they are moved to a secondary level where they do the rehab. Rehab. So we don't keep the patients after extubation that they have been moving to these extensive rehab facilities and rehab is handled by these facilities only. So uh, we saw the, the it been a big challenge uh, from first wave till now that uh, we have seen 40% of uh, health cares have been resigned or moved to other countries or uh, other facilities. So bringing in the new team and training them again to then became now as a big challenge. Now, are you facing the same in other part of the globe um, or is it the same? And it's definitely something to do with the burnout. Uh, many of them felt enough is enough, let's take rest. Let's say, let's go back to our families. <laughs> so that's going to bring in the new challenges uh, to face. Already there is shortage of uh, healthcare professionals. And by this, I think we'll have a new challenge. So I, I want to listen what it is coming from your states, how it's been addressed, and how can you protect them from going back, leaving their professions. Eric, would you like to comment? Well, I don't know that I have any answers. Um, <laughs> I just concur. Uh, we we have um, we we have seen the shifting of staff um, uh, to to other areas uh, with, within respiratory, um, and, and you know within our own institution. And, and I think it's pretty. Uh, it's not an not an uncommon problem that you know, that, that's being seen everywhere. And it's not just with the nursing, or not just with the respiratory staff, but it's with the nursing staff. And it's with, it's at the physician level too. Um, I think some of the major medical societies are, are really seriously addressing, you know, these issues at, and trying to understand how to help, um, uh, you know, when, when you ask our staff, um, what do they need? They just say more people. 
Um, we just need more people. Um, and, you know, the, you, you can't produce more people, you know, at, at the snap of a finger overnight. And so I think it's a, it's a large multifaceted problem that is clearly affecting uh, people, you know, on, on a global level. Eric, um, it's, so, it's so amazing that during the first wave, the most popular question that almost every director of respiratory therapy had last March, how many ventilators do you have? Nobody asked you how many RTs you had, but how many ventilators? And it's kind of amazing, you know, I know that uh, uh, Apple is working on self-driving car. There is no self-driving ventilators. You know, you do need a clinician at the bedside. So I so much appreciate your coming. Great. Um, we also have another question uh, from one of our viewers, and they're wondering if we can share our experiences using lung ultrasound in the management of COVID patients in the emergency department. Um, I do work in the emergency department frequently, and um, it's infrequent that we actually use lung ultrasound on these patients. Uh, the times that we do use it, it's really just to look for any evidence of curly B lines to see how they're going to fluid uh, manage these patients. Do they get aggressive diuresis or not? But with the COVID patients, that's typically not the issue. We try to really take um, equipment out of rooms with our PUI patients. Um, so rarely do we use um, lung ultrasound in those types of situations. Anybody else have any comments? Not really. I think uh, the last one, I think we'll ask nitric oxide with invasive ventilation. Uh, uh, I want Eric to come in and comment on this. We have, we have been using it at UAE, uh, but we did not see much improvement. I can say 30% of them or less than that have been benefited out of it. Do you have similar things on it or do you have any different is there any real benefits on inhaled nitric oxide? I would like to come on to nitric oxide if possible. So I, I, I agree so much with you. I don't think that nitric oxide is a panacea. It, it is a useful adjunct in about, I would say, like you said, about a third of the patients, 25, 30% of the patients will benefit, particularly okay. those who are hoovering right at the, like that, O2 set of 87, 88, and you kind of want to get them to 91 or 90. And, you know, you, you, you're not going to go and put somebody whose O2 set is 73 on nitric oxide and have saturation of 95 and land on the carrier, if you will, and proclaim victory. It's just not going to happen. Unless the patient's problem was pulmonary hypertension and not really COVID, then it's something else. But if it's like really purely COVID situation, I've never seen anybody who is like really dropping like a rock in their 70s or early 80s and you put them on nitric oxide and nitric oxide saves the day. But if you need to get them over the hump and they're like right there and you need just a little more to get them over it so you kind of know they're at least at 88 or 90, uh, you know, it, it seems to be helpful in some about 25 to 30% of cases. I, I agree 100% with it. Great. Well, it looks like we're over our time. Um, so maybe each panelist um, for with quick 30 second um, closing comment. Uh, Felix, would you like to start? Uh, look, first of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, Indian Association for Respiratory Care and Dan uh, for uh, being here and being able to share my experiences with you and learn from you folks. I think it's a great forum and uh, I wish um, everybody, if not a prosperous year, which would be great, prosperous, I mean, by decreasing number of COVID cases for everybody. And uh, hopefully um, this pandemic is gonna be coming to the end with the vaccines becoming more readily available throughout the world. And I wish, really wish everybody more prosperous year in the sense of uh, COVID coming down. and. Thank you again for the invitation. It was wonderful being here today with this panel. Great. Dr. Gee, uh, would you like to last um, offer a last comment? She may be on her plane by now. So um, uh, Eric? Uh, I, I echo Felix's uh, comments and uh, my sincere appreciation for the invitation to participate in the panel and, and share some of my experiences and, 
and uh, practices. Um, I think what I would uh, leave you with is, you know, some of the ideas that were shared uh, as well from the Madam Minister that spoke earlier is that um, keep evolving, uh, keep learning. There's so much out there that we uh, have yet to fully understand and, and to comprehend. And it, it, it's regardless of what level of practice that you find yourself in at that particular moment, um, whether it be student or advanced level practitioner uh, and keep pushing yourself and asking why and how uh, and, and searching for those answers uh, within the literature and uh, or, you know, from colleagues and, and glean whatever experiences that you can. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. And Harsha. Thank you so much, Dan. Uh, it was an immense pleasure for me to be in touch with you all, to listen to you. I want to have a three to four hour session. Actually, I want to thank IARC and my alma mater, Manipal College of Health Professions for organizing this. And with three of you, uh, we and Dr. G, and we have shared uh, what we could. Uh, but I think this is not enough. We need more sessions. I, and I'm sure IARC and ICRC will work on it towards having more sessions, more detailed sessions and sharing the knowledge. And I want to thank Felix, Eric, and yourself for sharing those valuable comments from. I, I just want to hear all those because I have any confusion. Is this the right thing happening? Is it the same happening there? It's just me you know, facing this. So, so I, I could clarify so many doubts. I'm sure all the attendees did as well. So thanks for your time and Great. for joining us. Thank you. Great. And then Dr. G just sent a text message. She says it's very noisy where she is, but she um, is thankful for being able to participate. Um, my last closing statement is to uh, remind everybody that you as respiratory therapists, as part of a multidisciplinary team, have the specialized knowledge, skills, and attributes to help improve patient outcomes. Uh, patient care is a team sport. Just by being involved with your professional organization is a team sport. The Indian Association and Academy for Respiratory Care cannot do it without volunteers and the support of their allies from other disciplines. So please consider getting involved. Uh, it takes more than one person. It takes a team of people to make a difference in the patients that we care for. And I want to end on thanking you for providing that superlative care to your patients and for caring. Um, so thank you for having me. Uh, Jethan? Back to you. Oh, we can't hear you. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Eric. Thank you, uh, uh, Felix and uh, uh, Dr. Manjush um, and uh, Dr. Madhura Binoy and uh, everyone, everyone who uh, spend their time. Uh, I, like the, I like the panel discussion uh, uh, better than my talk. This is what I should say. <laughs> I should replace it with more uh, time should be given for the panel discussions and uh, sharing of experiences. People like it more. And uh, uh, there are a lot of comments. There are a lot of queries that came into this and you answered it in a very uh, diplomatic way, and uh, I, I like the way you responded to the questions. And in fact, I do ask some questions, and I got the reasonable answer for that as well. Thank you so much for all your time and contributions, and uh, special thanks to you, Dan, for uh, bringing all of them together. It's not us; they, uh, we invited them. Actually, it's you invited them to uh, uh, do the entire work for us, and uh, in, in this very short time. It is quite difficult for getting them all together in, you know, on board. And uh, uh, we are really thankful for you. And thank you so much for Harsha, uh, Rutuja, and Mithula is there. Uh, Dr. Gee is there. She's all the way traveling. Thank you so much. Sanjay is already here. And Pratipa, thank you. Thank you so much for all the participants on behalf of IRC and ICRC as well. And uh, we will continue to do the same thing as uh, Dr. Kavita was uh, demanding to us. Uh, uh, maybe Dan is uh, the first person who wished to hear from her own mouth that what is happening in India. 
and it is obvious that there are so much things are happening in india we are i told you yesterday's meeting or day before yesterday when we met together we and me and you and uh, mother we are we are not allowing anyone to explode we are at the verge of an explosion but we are not allowing it just holding it for a, a meaningful explosion so at any time it will happen and uh, thank you for pitching and you are all are actually uh, making it uh, easy for us our way is getting more brighter so uh, future is so bright and uh, with our colleagues joins together uh, nothing is impossible when it is a small group it is easy to drive more faster this is what we learned from the past 3 4 years so uh, i hope our colleagues will also will uh, will uh, Uh, understand it in a better way and uh, they will also contribute more uh, towards the growth of the profession those who are away from the society those who are away from the association when we are together uh, it makes uh, uh, the voice become become more uh, you know unique and uh, people will listen so thank you so much thank you so much for everything that you are doing for us thank you thank you uh, i once again take this opportunity to thank all the, the both the moderators and the panelists for the session and uh, to make it a very lively event so with this we come to the end of the day one of the e-course so do join us uh, tomorrow you know uh, yes. you know there is one comment from me i forgot to tell uh, yes, those uh, for the attendees actually uh, sorry to interrupt you for the attendees for uh, tomorrow session they have to register separately the same link there are two options they can choose the second day they need to register separately for attending to tomorrow session uh, just as an announcement uh, not to miss it sorry for that thank you perfect so uh, tomorrow we have uh, more interesting uh, topics in store for you we have topics on airway management in covid 19 mechanical ventilation in covid 19 and a simulation based tutorial on uh, mechanical ventilation in the covid case scenario and also respiratory care in pediatric covid-19 patients and also on prone positioning in covid-19 patients and pulmonary rehabilitation in covid-19 and home health care bundle so do join us tomorrow and wish you all a very good day and good night thank you thank you binoy for hosting it yeah thank you thanks a lot thanks to all of you one and all thanks so much for coordinating it um